Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, July 13th, 2021 at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Boylston. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. Um, before we move forward I, um, with the pledge, I just wanted to um, um, ask that the commission um, uh, take a, a vote to allow for Commissioner Ryan Boylston to um, participate online. So, so moved. Second. Okay, please call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolson. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll bring him up. In the meantime, um, if you could all stand for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we are at agenda approval. Is there any changes or um, alterations? By yes. the commission? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, go ahead, Ms. Johnson. No, 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 you first. Go ahead. Okay. Go right ahead. Can I just, um, 6C and 6G for comment, please? 6C. That's correct. And 6G. And 6G. Okay. So that'll become 7AA and 7BB. Vice Mayor? And I wanted to pull to discuss 6B. 6B. That'll be 7CC. Anything else? Anyone else? Seeing none, entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. As amended. As amended. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Boston. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Franco. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Okay, we are at our presentations. Before we start, I just wanted to make mention, because we have a few very, um, special guests in the audience, uh, the Farringtons and uh, um, the board members for the Spady um, Heritage Cultural Museum. And I just wanted to uh, say congratulations um, on your 20 years. This, this marks their 20 year um, point and uh, we're very proud of you. Thank you so much. We just did a uh, proclamation and, and so We'll, we'll see you later on that, but uh, regardless, thank you so much for coming in. Um, so our first presentation on the schedule is 7A, which is our uh, annual financial um, report, our CAFRA, I believe it is. Hey there. Good afternoon, Scott Porter, audit partner with Kaler, Downton and Levine. Um, I must say this is a real delight to be here in person in front of everybody because- oh boy. Aren't we also tired of uh, appearing by computer? So um, with that, I want to um, begin with the financial highlights for 2020, certainly an unusual year. Um, and I think you'll see some of that in the actual numbers. So we'll start with the revenue portion of the general fund. And this is a five-year comparison. Um, this is similar to what we've done in the past in terms of trying to lay out for you what the trends have been in the financial area. You can tell even just by looking at the overall building blocks here that 2020 was a relatively flat year. It was actually slightly down from the prior years. And when you look at the text below in the first bullet point, you'll see that the total revenues were actually down approximately 1.2 million year to year 2020 compared to 2019. Um, that is actually a net number. There were some areas that were up and some areas that were down, um, but overall the areas that were down outweighed those that were up by 1.2 million. Um, the rest of these go through some comparative information for the five year period. Um, over the five-year period, as you can tell by looking at the chart, the revenues were up, and for the most part, they were up in, the, in each of the major areas. So with that, we'll move on to the expenditure area of the general fund. Um, and the expenditure trends are generally consistent with the overall trends in the prior year. In other words, they, while the revenues were down, the expenditures were up. 
approximately 2.4 million 2020 compared to 2019. And that's not an exorbitant increase, it's simply a trend um, over that five year period that's pretty consistent. Okay. The next area is the fund balance. This is the general fund assigned and unassigned fund balance, generally what's available to be appropriated for the subsequent year budget. As you can see in 2020, there was a decrease and not a real significant decrease. Overall, the total was down approximately 500,000 from 2020 to 2019. Um, and that really reflects the excess of the expenditures over the revenue in 2020. And then we will move on to the other major operating fund of the city, which is the water and sewer fund. Um, and you can see from the chart here that that remains relatively consistent year over year. And in fact, there was only a, a minor change in the rev total revenues and total expenses compared to the prior year. Okay, with that, we'll move into the actual comprehensive annual financial report, which is, I believe you each have a copy of the big 200 plus page book. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to do is just point out to you a few of the areas in the book that are important to look at. First, you'll notice there are tabs on each section. It is divided into four sections, the introductory section, the financial, statistical, and compliance section. Um, our responsibility really goes to the financial section and the compliance section. Uh, the, while the entire uh, comprehensive report is put together by the finance department, um, our audit responsibility generally extends to the finance section and the reports included in the compliance areas. So starting with the financial section on page one of that tab, is our independent auditor's report. Um, it is, even though it goes across two plus pages, uh, it is an unmodified opinion or the highest level of opinion we can give you on the financial statements that they are presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Following that is management's discussion and analysis. This is intended to give you a high level overview um, generally on a comparative basis of the operations of the city. And if you want generally a, a, a good analysis or comparative, this is a, a good document to read in a matter of a few pages. You can get a pretty good flavor for what, what is going on and what's changed. Then on the financial statements actually begin on page 17. The first two on page 17 and page 18 are what are referred to as the government-wide statements without getting into a lot of detail here. Um, the government-wide are full accrual statements comparable to what you would have in a business. They show all assets, all liabilities, and most particularly the long-term assets, capital assets, and long-term debt. The statements that are more familiar looking are the fund financial statements that begin on page 19. Um, and there you'll see the first fund is the general fund, and that is the primary operating fund of the city that is the source of much of the information in the financial highlights for the governmental section. Following that are the notes on page 28. This is a lot of required disclosure detail uh, beginning with the significant accounting policies. Um, there are a couple notes that I want to point, point you to. The first is the employee retirement plans that begin on page 57. Um, this is always uh, a big liability in your financial statements. And if you look a couple pages back on page 61, you'll see a table in the middle of the page that summarizes the net pension liability, which totals 120 million at September 30th, 2020. That is actually down approximately 6 million from the prior year. Um, in order to get to the net change, you have to include these deferred numbers, which are essentially prepaids and deferred revenues. And you can see the pension expense for 2020 was 26.1 million, the last number in that table. That compares to 
nine million for the prior year or decrease of roughly a million eight. And that's your true decrease across all those numbers for the year. Okay, following that, on page 60, 71 are the other post-employment benefits. This is the other big non-cash liability that appears in your financial statements. And this uh, represents things um, primarily the health insurance. So if you look at the similar table on page 71 towards the bottom of the page, you'll see the total post-employment benefit liability was roughly $34 million at September 30, 2020. That compares to about $30 million the prior year. So that liability was up. Um, and overall, the expense, the last number in that table was $3 million for 2020. That compares to $1.9 million in the prior year, or an increase of roughly $1.1 million. So both of those benefits are trending upward. Following that, the other tables outside of the financial statements, there's a budgetary presentation on page 81. This is the general fund comparison of the original budget, the amended budget, the actual amounts, and the favorable or unfavorable variants. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I just, okay. I'm still on the pension for a moment. <laughs> I'm, okay. I apologize. We got this book today, and I'm... Take a I like to take a little time, but just, can we go back to the page uh, 61 for a moment? 61, sure. So our total pension liability, the city of Delbury, Delray Beach, is 120? Yes. Okay. What's referred to as the net pension liability. It's an actuarially calculated number. $120 million. $120 million. Okay. And then you have the outflow that's of... That's not an aggregate. That's just our safety. Is that correct? That's, I'm sorry? That's not an aggregate. Isn't that just our safety pension? It's not the... No, that is the total whole? across okay, all it. three The general, counties. the police, and oh, the... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see the general. You general it. three, the police is $59 million. The firefighters, $57 million. So then you have the deferred outflow of resources... Those are the payments out? It's complicated. Okay. <laughs> I it's, need, it's, an, it's an actuarial calculation, and what they do is they take certain components of the change in the pension liability, and because it is a long-term plan, they, they take each of those, for instance, the change in the market value, and if you remember from the actuarial valuations, they use a five-year smoothing meth methodology. Okay. And so part of that number is amortized over five years. Okay. The annual change in that number, so as not to create wild fluctuations. And so that deferred number is the unamortized portion, if you will, of those changes. And then could you, the inflow is, so the outflow is the 29.7 million. Right. And the inflow is the 6.4 right. million. And it's, it's basically the same concept, just different pieces of that actuarial determination each year okay. that make up the inflows and the outflows. It's governmental accounting. It doesn't make a lot of sense to business Thank people, you. but <laughs> it's governmental accounting. I apologize accounting. for slowing you down. No problem. Well, I have a question then while yes, we're doing this on 71. We had an increase of uh, about, it, it about doubled. Is that what, it, what happened there? And, it, and how did that happen? It it is in the straight liability number, but keep in mind that actuarially, just like the pension numbers, those deferred numbers enter into it. So if there's um, a significant change in the discount rate or the interest rate, it has a significant impact on that number um, each year. And then that gets amortized in over a four to five year period. So while the, the liability number may change directly, those, a portion of that change is in those deferred numbers. So you have to take them all together. And that's why I pointed to the expense number, because that is really the true change on a year-to-year -year basis. And that did increase about $1.1 million. Okay. Do, you, do we know why it increased that? Great. In, in, the, in the case of the um, post-employment benefits, I believe it was attributable to the discount rate change because you have an unfunded plan 
in, in those post-employment benefits. And um, generally what that means is unlike the pensions, you, you're not setting money aside to pay those. Um, it's really an accounting calculation that is required in the financial statements. It's not something that you pay out. Um, but the change is, is really related to the decline in interest rates. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, I was saying. Okay. Thank you. Okay, page 81, we were on the budgetary comparison. Um, and this gives you a good idea in the general fund of the change in the total revenues. You can see that the revenues were under budget, roughly 5.7 million. Expenditures were um, under budget by 5.7 or 5.4 million. And so overall, in total, I'm looking at the last column, mm -hmm. the last number, you can see that the um, difference in the budget was roughly 329,000. So really, overall, a very good result considering what happened in, in 2020. Okay, following that on page 86 is a great deal more detail. Can I ask one more question? Certainly. I apologize. When you're giving us this calculation here, does that include money we pull from our fund to balance or not? It, it includes it on a budgetary basis. For instance, if you look at the last line under revenues, you'll see prior year surplus. Right. And you'll see numbers in each of the budgetary columns and a zero in the actual. Right. Okay, and that's, that's because that is not producing cash flow dollars for you um, to then finance expenditures. Okay, so while it's a portion of the budget, it's not money coming into the city. It's you're taking your own money. And right. So then the balance looks remarkably different. So so we you know like when when we say three twenty nine off, so it looks good. It really doesn't because we took the the four six and put it in. Correct. Well, actually, the the four the four point nine million that's the prior year surplus is in there as a negative number. Okay. So if you add that back. Your um, unfavorable Plus. variance on the revenue drops significantly. Okay. So you actually did much better mm -hmm. okay. than the table shows. Thank you. Good to know. Okay, so then beginning on page 86 are detailed schedules that are required for the pension plans. And these show the calculation of the net pension liability. So starting on page 86, and this is over a seven-year period. Eventually, this will grow to a full 10 years, which is the required number. Um, so a year is added each year until we get to 10 years, and then they start, start dropping off. But if you look at the 2020 column and follow that down to, you'll see the total pension liability is $143.5 million. And from that, there are assets in the plan of roughly 140.5 million so you subtract those two and you get the net pension liability of roughly three million dollars and then there are some statistic stati statistical percentages at the bottom to provide some additional comparability um, but generally that's how those numbers are calculated and there are tables like this for each of the three pension plans beginning right. in this section mm -hmm. Okay, moving on back, following that, there are combining statements. So if you look at page 103, this is a listing of all the, what are referred to as non-major governmental funds, and they're, they're a set of non-major combining statements for the governmentals, the enterprise funds, the internal service funds, as well as the pension plans, just so you can see what is happening in each one of those individual funds. Okay, we're getting there. Following that, then, um, we have the statistical section. It generally presents 10-year historical trend information for a variety of factors, re revenue, expenditures, debt service, and debt coverage. So I'm not going to go through those in great detail, but the last section I wanted to comment on was the compliance section, which is the last in the comprehensive report. And beginning on page 161 is our auditor's report on internal control 
and compliance as it relates to the city's financial statements. And I'm happy to tell you there are no internal control matters and no compliance matters. So very good result. Okay. Okay, following that, on page 163, this is a summary that's required by the federal government to summarize your federal grant programs. And behind that are the state programs. And this is referred to as a single audit. Um, so you can see here that there were um, federal expenditures of 2,364,000 for 2020, as well as state expenditures on page 164 of roughly 800,000. A portion of that is required to be audited under complex percentage calculations that are um, determined by the federal government in the state of Florida. The results of that are on page 166, which is our report on single audit compliance and internal control. It is an unmodified opinion on both compliance and internal control, meaning there are no significant issues, no matters that need to be reported um, under the single audit requirements. And then following that, on page 168 is the schedule of findings and question costs. And what you always want to see here generally is along the far right side, no answers. No answers in this case are good. That means there, in essence, are no issues and no problems to report. And then on the next part of that, on page 169, if there were any issues, they would be detailed in the very uh, last three sections. And as you can see, the answers there are none and not applicable. And then the last item in this section is our management letter on page 170. There is only one item to report here. Um, and these are generally, when they're in the management letter, considered non-major or non-significant items that we still want to bring to the attention of the commission. And we have one item on, two, on payroll processing that relates back to 2019 that we also identified the same issue in 2020. Um, and I can tell you my personal opinion on this is it has to do with review and approval of timesheets. Um, and I think the issues that we identified were all in that time period when things were shutting down and people were working remotely and there was simply not an approval documented on the timesheet. So um, something to address, but not something that we consider to be a serious matter. And then on page 173, there is management's response. Um, not really much there other than saying that we'll address it, which I believe the management group will do. And that concludes my comments. Any questions? Overall, I would say, really, in, in light of the year and what took place in 2020, um, I think the city had a very good year financially as, as well as in terms of compliance and um, managing operations through a partial shutdown. Thank you very much, um, Scott or Mr. Porter. Um, the, uh, we, were, we were just doing a first budget review um, uh, just before you came in in a workshop, uh, just you know, kind of almost the highest level. And one of the things that was brought up is that we're going to have to change some of the structure of our budgeting, which would mean that we have to um, look at the building department differently than we have been, which is, I think it's been pretty much just part of our general um, you know, operations general and revenue. Um, so my question, and really it wasn't able to be answered, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose it to you, um, is how, how could we, I mean, is it something that you would see in your audit that we are not actually in compliance with something like that within the budget? Um, well, I think, I think there are a number of issues here. Um, in, in terms of compliance, I don't believe there's any compliance requirement that it be separated no, in, that's, into a that's separate file. No, that's what we heard, right. Right. Um, the issue with, with building and building permits is, is a general state law, and there are more specific guidance that's come out from the legislature at this point. But the general guidance on building permits has always been that the revenue derived from the permit has to be directly related to the expense. In other words, 
um, you're supposed to charge fees that are based upon okay. your cost to do the, the permit operation. Um, this actually came up back in 2017 and 2018, and there was a separate fund established in 2017. What happened, though, was when, when that fund was established, they transferred accounts representing just the direct revenue and the direct expenses, and as a result of that, it had a very high net revenue number. It made, made it look like the city was making a fortune on permits, um, which was generally not the case because what happened was in moving the direct revenue and expenses, they did not account for any of the indirect costs or any of the overhead that's associated with that operation. There obviously is, is a lot of that. Um, so at that point in time, and keep in mind that this occurred during the time frame when there were significant problems in internal control. It's when we had the, the book that added about 20, 25 pages of deficiencies in internal control and compliance issues. Um, so my suggestion to them was rather than give the impression that was not accurate, that the fund be reversed and rolled back into general fund until such time as a proper accounting could be made of all the costs that went in or should go in to that fund and at that point in time then separate it out. Um, the other issue that, that we had with how it was done is it really ultimately comes back to a legal issue and compliance with Florida statutes. We're not attorneys, but the city's legal counsel was never consulted on how those costs should be accounted for and what should be in that fund versus what should not be in that fund. So it was a case of rather than doing something that was only half right, mm -hmm. put it back the way it was, do the basic research, get an understanding until you can put it in the right way. And unfortunately, I think with a lot of the transition and positions, um, that has gotten deferred until perhaps your budget meeting today. I think it was, and I appreciate your explanation, and I can attest to the fact that um, we were out of compliance in a lot of areas during that time and uh, have pulled ourselves out of that yes. a spiral down. So I appreciate your explanation. It makes more sense you know, now, understanding it. Um, do you have any recommendations as to how you can make sure that you know you're grabbing as much of that revenue and making sure that it doesn't have that huge difference. Well, I, again, I think I think I think the first step is um, because it is a compliance issue. The first issue is to um, comply with what the mm -hmm. state law is now, and and that I think requires the input of the city attorney. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece of that is to capture all the costs, not just part of the cost. Mm -hmm. Because I, don't, I think if you don't have all the costs, you're going to give the wrong impression, mm -hmm. um, which is sometimes, oftentimes, more detrimental than sure. not showing it at all. So it's a question of doing it halfway versus doing it right. Got it. And um, so I think um, just in the brief conversation that I've had with Mr. Leggy mm -hmm. um, before the meeting, he seemed to be accounting for all those pieces that were left out previously. Mm -hmm. So I think by doing it, um, in next year's budget, you'll certainly have a much more accurate accounting of all those costs and get to a, a fairly represented number. I will, I will say, too, that it's, it's generally only the larger cities that separately account for these funds in a separate fund. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say it's good or bad, um, but it has not, up to this point, really been something that is a major issue, if you will in Florida financial reporting. Um, it is an issue that if the Auditor General were to come down and spend six months going through all your records and doing compliance audit, I can almost guarantee you that they would have a comment on this. But having said that, it's not something that when they get your annual report and they review it every year, that they send comments back to the city or back to us that says, hey, what about the accounting for the building permit funds? It just has never happened historically to this day, so. Okay, thank you very much uh, to the commission. Any questions? Thank you. 
Okay. Appreciate your report. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank and, you. and I'm sure there'll be questions in the interim and we'll, we know how to reach you. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> All right, very good. Moving on to um, our item uh, 4B, which is the Green Implementation Advancement Board. It's an annual report. You are like the, the guy of the day. It's my day. <laughs> I, I, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, Ken Edwards, Sustainability Officer for the, the city, and I'm honored to introduce the presenter for the Green Implementation Advancement Board Annual Report. The report is required as a part of the founding uh, resolution. Hal Stern could not, the chair, could not uh, attend today in person, so the presenter will be Sarah Lucas, the Vice Chair for the Green Board. Sarah. Hello, everyone, <clears throat> and thank you for having me here today. As Kent um, so clearly pointed out, I am not Hal. I'm Sarah Lucas, I'm vice chair of the Green Board, and I'm here representing Hal Stern, our board chair, along with the rest of our board members, who include Lisa Shaheen, Susan LeBron, Shanaz Malik, and our alternate board members, Christina Hammond and Marin Graben. Also wanted to acknowledge Nancy Channon, who's one of our new incoming board members and will be with us in this coming year. So thank you for um, your time and we'll move quickly uh, through everything we've got to report. Okay, so looking back, what have we been up to? We've been busy, just like all of you, and some of our major accomplishments over this past difficult year include uh, moving forward with the tree planting campaign, where we have the ambitious goal of, with your support and leadership, of planting 10,000 new trees. Um, we've got 2,000 of those, uh, and you know certainly more work to do. Limiting polystyrenes um, through uh, the, the measures that we have within our regulatory bandwidth. Installation of more operational electric vehicle chargers. We've moved forward with the Green Business Certification Program, an initiative that came directly from a suggestion uh, from this dais, and we thank you for your leadership there. The picture you see here is the recipient of our first Green Business Certification um, uh, Award, and as you know, this is a, a voluntary opt-in program. And we've also continued to do significant education on climate change and rising sea levels uh, through the Rise Climate and Art Festival, which many of you were a part of, and other activities. And many of the initiatives that we've been working on are still ongoing. I mentioned the tree planning. Uh, the RFP here has four more years left to it, um, so we'll continue to move forward there. Uh, earlier today, um, when Kent presented the climate change vulnerability assessment to you, there were some interesting questions and comments related to some of the things we might be able to do uh, on green building. And we've made some recommendations on moving forward with the green building ordinance, which has had its first reading in front of you all. I understand it'll have its second reading in August. And enactment of a strong green building ordinance is something that can be a major step forward for the city to demonstrate leadership on sustainability issues. It's also something uh, that we feel can be guided by the principle that things that are um, sustainable and resilient can also uh, be consistent with public safety. We think that those two things meld very well together. So moving forward uh, with those principles in mind. Of course, we'll continue to do additional education and outreach. Uh, you see the picture here. When we give away trees, we're also raising awareness, not just getting trees out there into the community, but also raising awareness. And uh, with the CCVA um, that you just heard about, uh, we're reaching the end of that cycle, but there's certainly um, more to do uh, and more actions to, to take on that important issue. As we continue to look forward, um, you know, some of the initiatives for the coming year, we expect to uh, focus on the completion of both a tree inventory and an urban forest management plan. And in this area, there's an executed agreement that was signed on Friday. So we look forward to seeing the consultant's report here. Um, I, I understand that'll probably take a few months, but certainly um, by the fall, we'll have some new information um, on the status of, of the status quo. We did things a little backwards. We started planting new trees before we really even had a good sense of, uh, of what we've got in the community. But both the tree inventory and the urban forest management plan should inform us of, uh, of, of what we've actually got happening here and will help us uh, make 
uh, smart common sense recommendations that reflect the priorities of all the citizens of our city going forward. And then on plastics and polystyrene, um, the Skip the Straw campaign, um, which again, we very much appreciate your leadership on, um, that was uh, related to Ordinance 1019, and there are additional actions we may be able to take there related to uh, regulating mylar balloons, confetti, those types of things. We're also going to be looking um, for the city to, um, to support a resolution that would provide clarification of Florida Statute 500.90. And this, this is an area where there's been, I, I see some nods, there's been some ambiguity as to um, what the actual, um, what is within our, our, our ability to, to make recommendations on and regulate and not. So, um, you know, our, our important, uh, you know, ability to regulate our own communities. We'll be looking for clarification there. And so those are some of the initiatives that we expect to continue moving forward on. And then our priorities. These are areas that we know are important. We as a board are going to be continuing to learn about these areas and we do expect to make recommendations, but right now we're very much in the information gathering phase, working with our city staff and others. So this includes a review of the city tree ordinance. We've got a tree planning campaign. We've got a couple of projects where we're going to you know, get information over the next couple of months from the consultants. So in addition to planting new trees, we want to protect the trees that we already have in place. Um, and we want to make sure we've got smart policy in place to do so. Um, these policies and practices uh, should be informed by the urban Ma forest management plan. Um, on the important issue of climate change, I mean, the, the comp plan has many recommendations or, or items related to greenhouse gas reduction. Some of the areas that we're exploring, continuing to, to move forward with infrastructure related to electric vehicles. And then from a city perspective, uh, you know, making sure that the, the buildings and the renovations that we're doing on our own properties are consistent with green building standards. Additionally, we can't just transition every city vehicle over to you know, a, a, a moped, uh, and no one wants to do that. But let's begin planning for a transition to, uh, to smart uh, transportation options for both the city and the citizens that live here. And then lastly, enormous issue of solid waste and recycling. Um, this contract is going to be up for renewal in the coming year. These are big, complicated issues. We are going to be making some recommendations, but again, we wanna make sure that those recommendations are informed by uh, what the current practices and policies are. So we'll be reviewing what's in place uh, with some of the recycling programs, looking to what we can do to promote composting, both at the individual and organizational level, and you know, and any other levers that might be available to us in making sure that the waste management uh, contract does uh, uh, do what it can to move the, the ball forward on sustainability. And I think I went a little bit long, but I wanted to say thank you. And if you have any questions or comments, um, the, the, what I'll close with is we appreciate you. And these are issues that we feel we've seen uh, leadership from all of you on. We feel like these are issues that bring the community together and um, they're, they're important, and we hope to continue to look uh, for that kind of leadership uh, in the coming year as well. Thank you so much, Sarah, and I, I, can't, I couldn't agree with you more. I think this is the type of thing that does bring people together and in the current climate, <laughs> exactly, in the current climate um, across you know, the, the, the United States and everywhere else where the heat is rising and we're seeing the effects of climate change, um, even in our little town with water intrusion and water not no longer um, following the old path of, you know, kind of absorbing into the ground as quick as it used to. Um, we are definitely already feeling the effects. So what we can do, whatever we can do to help out the future, I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to do this. Um, I, I think I did hear that this urban, um, your urban... Uh, uh, urban forest, forest man man right, urban forest forest management, management of our trees would include... Um, pointing out legacy trees or trees that have been are significant because, you know, one of the things that's very difficult for me to understand is how we can take down, you know, a huge canopy of a tree 
um, and put up some stalky, you know, trees that are never going to have that kind of coverage for the next, you know, who knows, 10 years. Um, it will take a small, you know, a sprout, you know, to, to get to that point. So I'm just hoping that that includes that because we can do as much as we want to moving forward in um, creating a, a, a more of a canopy in, in, in Delray Beach, but really actually it might be two steps forward, three steps backwards if we're taking out the legacy trees that are actually already providing that canopy in a lot of areas. So that was one thing I just wanted to make sure of, and it sounded like you, you answered that. And yep. of course... The other thing that we had just talked about just before you during the um, meeting uh, prior, the, the workshop, was some of the things that we could possibly do in order to be able to kind of promote um, green living, for instance, just, you know, new builds have, uh, you know, an outlet in the, in the garage. It's a very expensive thing to add. It's mm -hmm. not so much when you're actually building the property to have that you know, installed. Uh, same thing with just not necessarily the panels but having a hookup on your roof so that if somebody wants to put solar in, um, it's much easier than um, having to go in and, and go backwards retro, um, you know, a, a roof that's, uh, you know, you know um, leak tight where it could be done so much simpler in the process of the build. So these are the kinds of things that I'm hoping that we're going to see in the future as being part of our mission and our, you know, rules and regs or whatever you want to call them uh, moving forward. Um, so anyway... That, that was what, you know, oh, and one other thing, I, you know, it's a very interesting issue, and I know that recycling was something that we were able to sell at one point, and I think it's now not so much. I, I don't remember, and I'm not even so sure that that was a good thing because I'm wondering how much of that ended up in our oceans, regardless. Um, story for another day. But I'm noticing that the recycling that we're doing on our blocks are not picking up even corrugated, you know, um, I guess, you know, boxes that are too big. Is that normal? And how, I mean, is that important? Because I mean, I, I have to put it in my bulk pickup and I'm, I'm not, I mean, I flattened them out. I did all the things I'm supposed to do. I thought I was supposed to do, but I'm just curious, is there a certain size that basically they just won't pick up anymore? Yeah, I've got to tell you, I, um, I'm i not boots on the ground with, um, you know, the folks who are, uh, who are working to collect art and, you know, do that work every day to to get our recycling and our trash picked up. That said, um, what we're trying to do is work with waste management currently to get more information about the types of issues and concerns that you have. I do know there are lots of drop-off places where mm. you can take that no, flattened I can take cardboard. It, yeah, yep. Most people we won't, have one though, right you know, it's There's one right here. to get them to recycle. Yeah. So, yep. you know, at their doorstep. So, you know, you have to think about that. But Agreed. anyway, it's something yep. to check into for you. And then the only other thing that I had a question about also is I've noticed all the plantings that are going on all the, the trees um, over at Pine Grove. I've noticed them also on, on uh, Lake Ida Road right behind Spady Museum in that water retention area. Um, but I notice a lot of them die, too. So like Pine Grove, the entire row of just planted trees are all burnt, you know. And I'm just wondering, are we? Do we have any have any way of being able to, I don't know, figure out how to keep them alive? I mean, some areas seem to do well, and other areas don't. And this is one that seems to not. And it's an area that we need to have those those tree growth. So. Yeah, it's an important issue. And I think that it is part of the conversation that we have with the contractor. Um, you know, when we do new plantings, it's not just about getting them in the ground. It's about getting them in the ground and growing and flourishing. There is a certain amount of, um, of loss that does happen mm -hmm. when you do new tree sure. plantings. Um, but we can, we can look into, uh, you know, what specifically has happened in, in Pine Grove, if there's a whole area. Yeah, it seems like the whole line. Of yeah. Them, right and, and sometimes, um, sometimes trees look like they're not True. Okay. And, and I'm not an arborist, I wouldn't yep, know. Yeah, I'm not either, but um, it's an issue we can look into. Sounds great. To the commission, any other questions? Yes, I have one, but. Sure. You want to. Oh, did you want to? Uh, Vice Mayor. And thank you. And thank you so much for that presentation. I know that uh, the Green Implementation Board has not always been front and foremost, but now that climate change is on everyone's mind, you're really, really important to the city. I've been a little confused since I've uh, been elected about the tree planting program. And it was mentioned today when we uh, think it was the climate change presentation. I know very little about it. I know that we just had an incidence of tree clearing, but I don't hear a lot about tree planting. Mm -hmm. So I just wish that one day we could have a really good workshop about it, introduce it, talk about the money that's in it, talk about how much money we need 
put into it if it's not there. And I understand the developers are supposed to put a certain amount in it. It's like the parking. Um, There's a trust fund for when. It's like the parking. Yep. We don't, mm -hmm. it's there, but nobody talks about it. Gets it gets about $386,000 right now. And are we planning on planting trees and where are we planting them or just, just a general so over the past year, it's my understanding, we've planted um, 2,000 new trees and over we have uh, a plan over the next years, two through five of this goal to, to put 8,000 additional new trees in the ground. But the other piece of it is protecting the existing trees. Right. So we, we can't just plant new trees. Please go ahead, Commissioner. No, I was going to just suggest that the uh, Delray Beach Preservation Trust is very much involved in this. And in fact, there are a lot of cities doing a lot more than we are with respect to preservation because you're right, it takes like 100 trees to replace the canopy of one mature tree. So it's not enough to be planting. We really need to preserve. And they do it. Um, actually, I'll just email you some of this, the research that I have. Great. Because there is a lot more we can be doing. And I think you have a, an audience here that would like to see that. So I look forward to working with you. I, I want you to know you are heard. Um, this line of inquiry is exciting for us. And we'll get back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you have you. to do a workshop. Okay. <laughs> Assistant City Manager, did you want to say anything? Uh, no, in fact, uh, you know, I did want to add that we have, you know, I think Kent uh, talked on it and, and you did as well about having the tree inventory really shows us where those trees that we are hoping to plant go. We are running out of city property to squeeze in 2,000 more trees or so to make our goal. So, you know, we do have to address where they go on private property and encourage um, that sort of implementation. But um, so there's many steps in this process before we can just go out and, and plant. And Kent and I have talked a lot about how, how do we move forward on planting maybe larger trees, right? They cost more uh, and are harder to, to sort of maintain so that they take and, and adapt to the new space. But you know, we, can't, you know, we all agree that we can't keep planting seedlings forever and ever and, and not addressing maybe a range of different sizes of trees and styles of trees and where it's appropriate. It's on our radar. Very good. Anything else? Being done? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Great Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Mayor, I just want to let you know, Commissioner Boylston is on the line. He yes. was able oh, to Oh, I'm sorry. In. Commissioner I, I don't Boylston. know if he has anything to say, but um, I, I he totally is, forgot. He is yes. Commissioner Boylston, did you have anything you wanted to add? All right, I take it back. <laughs> okay. Maybe he's not on the line. <laughs> no, not at all, but uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so moving on. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, to the um, uh, section five, which is our comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda items. We're going to start with the assistant city manager response to prior com public comments and inquiries, if there are any. I have none at this time, Mayor. Very good. And so now we're going to move to the public. If there's anybody in the public that would like to step up and say anything about an item that is not a public hearing item or a quasi-judicial item, you're welcome to do that now. You just approach the uh, sign in, approach the uh, microphone, and it's three minutes each. And state your name and address. Hi, Deborah Garrido Stravino, 3631 Lowson Boulevard. Um, I've lived in Delray Beach since 1972. I'm sorry, 1973. <laughs> My concern today is the upkeep of the cemetery, uh, not being able to read headstones particularly. I have been in contact with very various city employees for approximately 10 years now. The last person I spoke to uh, six months ago, Yasmin, in the, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot her, uh, anyway. Uh, assured me that with the remodeling of the cemetery that I would no longer find it unsatisfactory. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Upon arriving to pay my respects today, um, my he grandparents' headstones were unreadable uh, due to growth, you know, overgrowth and, and dirt. Um, I do have pictures if uh, you're interested in seeing. Um, I keep a gardening shovel in my car for such occasions. I was immediately overcome with emotion and decided to take action today instead of cleaning. And upon my call to the city manager's office, I was again referred to back to Parks and Rec and Yasmin. And um, when I was not able to get a satisfactory response from her, 
Um, I expressed to her that I would attend this meeting tonight, at which point she told me whatever I have to do. So please, someone give me peace of mind as I leave here today that I will never have to experience the lack of respect in the upkeep of our cemetery. Um, please bring peace of mind to me and other families to be able to pay our respects properly. Deborah, let me ask you a question. Is it, is it overgrowth of, of vegetation? Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, usually grass, but today it was weeds. Okay, all right. So they're not like, um, and someone came out there to, to meet me today to see, and they took some pictures too. Okay. But like I said, this has been ongoing, and I just can't get anyone to take responsibility. You know, Parks and Rec tells me to go to a city manager. City manager tells me go to back, back to Parks and Rec. Got it. So Can I can't follow through with that. Um, so Duncan will be your your contact, and he's the assistant city manager. So he'll he'll follow through with you to make sure okay. that uh, we take care of that. Yeah, I tried you know various times to meet meet uh, you know speak to to different people and no one. Great. Yeah, I guess it's not a concern, but all right, well, it's well, ours. So we'll, right. we'll make sure. Thank you very much. You Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Mavis Benson, 800 Greenswood Court. I am a merchant on the avenue. I co-chair, or I chair the Merchants and Business Association, and I'm on the DDA board. For those of you who like to plan ahead, I want to remind you that August is restaurant month throughout our downtown. If you'll remember last year, you trusted us to have a week event, um, our socially distanced dining, which was beautiful, it was magical, it was hot. <laughs> so this year you have the whole month and we encourage you to th frequent your favorites as you always do, but we also encourage you to explore, try restaurants perhaps, this is a great time to try a restaurant that maybe you're not on a regular basis going to, so give it a try and discover some of the new restaurants that are in the area. Um, it's a great event. I think right now, how many do we have signed up, Laura? Um, 20. So that's a good portion of our downtown. So we encourage everybody to come down, visit all our restaurants, and as always, we thank the commission for what you do for our merchants in our downtown, and we also express our appreciation for our locals, our community, because you're here for us 365 days of the year, and without you, we wouldn't be the thriving downtown, which we are. So our thanks to all. Mark your calendars. Thank you. Thank you. Got it. Anyone else? No? Okay. Seeing no one, I'm gonna close the public comments. And we are moving on to our regular agenda, which we have taken three items off the consent agenda and moved them forward. The first is was originally 6C, that is now going to become 7AA. Uh, did we move to approve the consent agenda? Oh my gosh, I don't think we did. I'm sorry. We have a, a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Do we have a motion? So move. Second. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? In and out. Okay, so um, we are moving to um, 7AA, which is was originally 6C on the uh, regular, I mean, on the consent agenda, and this is with Chief Tommy, and I believe that it was uh, Commissioner Cassell. You pulled this item. I did, and I, I only pulled this because Chief, you know my feelings on this. With all respect, the eight-year drop is unprecedented. When you presented it to us, no one, none of the surrounding cities had it. Mm -hmm. I don't support it, um, and I'm sorry. So I pulled this off the consent because I prefer to vote uh, no on this item. Just uh, for point of clarification, uh, you've already voted yes for these individuals that are in the supervisory unit for the... Correct, but okay. this is part Just of it. Sure so you, you understand? Under yes, you understand what okay. I'm saying, and yes. I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any anything else? No. Okay. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. No. Mr. Bolston. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. No. Does that mean it doesn't pass? Oh. Ba -ba -bum. 
Is Mr. Boylston on? He is. I see him connected, but I'm, I guess he's Can we not hear him? This. Because that would be important to have his <laughs> vote. <laughs> I'm going to try to get him. OK. I want a motion to defer to later in the meeting? Well, we've let's just see if he ha he can add the no final problem. vote. I'm gonna see if we can just do it by speaker. You go. Uh, he he texted yes. Yes. Oh. On the backup here. Hey, Lynn. Hi. Can you hear me? I have you on I'm, speaker. I, I'm here. Uh, okay. Yeah. We, yeah. We can't hear you. Um. So can we get your vote on item number six C, yes. which is the CBA? Uh, item number six C, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. We got, got it. it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll have IT work on the issues. Okay, moving on to um, 6B, I'm sorry, 7BB, which was originally 6G. And yep. this, I believe, was pulled by. I also pulled that just for discussion because I think this is a piggyback on the contract for um, Sunshine Cleaners. And, you know, I had this discussion with um, City Manager Gretzis. There are local janitorial services that are small that could do these jobs. This is a, I think, a 39 thousand dollar a year contract for the uh, cleaning of the inside of the golf course uh, you know building and I don't know why we're not I was just wondering if we could do we need to piggyback this or can we find a local cleaning company that would appreciate this job so our interim purchasing director Ms. Treisman is here thank you welcome hi hi Good afternoon, Lise Treisman, Acting Purchasing Director. So um, yes, we could um, advertise a solicitation to the marketplace, but there's no guarantee that, because we don't have a local, um, local preference, there's no guarantee that a local firm is going to. Understood, they could apply, somebody else could Absolutely. apply, but versus doing it as a piggyback and just giving it to Sunshine, I wonder if we wouldn't be wise to get some of these Sunshine. other opportunities. Is now joining. Sugar. Oh. These are opportunities that, that a local business sure. might appreciate. Sure. May, service. It's not. May I? Yes, please That's, do. I know several local cleaning businesses that would probably love to have this work. I, I agree with you, Commissioner uh, Cassell. We've not been doing a very good job of employing our locals. We, we, we can't do that without a local preference is what I think uh, the right. issue is. you're saying? So why Correct. don't we have a local? Uh, I, I, the, the local preference it takes, we're not would doing probably it. be good across the board. I don't know if you can apply it to things like this, you probably can't, but perhaps we could just put it out there. And, you know, if we know local businesses, we encourage them to apply and see how it goes versus doing a piggyback on this company. Um, I'm just, it's for our discussion. Sure. I, I don't think a lot of these citizens, the local businessmen, understand how to even get, mm -hmm. because that's been a complaint to me. How do I get in? And it's not very easy because we don't make it very easy. And I don't know if that's on purpose or not. I'd like to not think that. We don't make a lot Welcome of things to government. easy. Yes. And I think that's when we are constantly talking about encouraging our small businessmen and women, but we're constantly also putting roadblocks in their way, we're double talking all well, the time. I, don't, I wouldn't say there's roadblocks, but perhaps, um, I guess, just my suggestion is on a small contract like this where it should be pretty simple to find somebody local to do it. Um, maybe we, c I, d I don't know how this will work and I don't know if I'm creating more of an issue, but for myself, I would like to see some local businesses getting these type of contracts. So well, I guess, however you know, we- The issue here is that there is no opportunity for anybody else but Sunshine if in fact we don't go out to bid correct. using this as a piggyback. And I think that's, that that's really the issue. There is no chance of a local getting it. And I can't, we cannot guarantee a local because again, we do not have a local preference. Correct. However, hopefully that will be somewhat handled if we go through this disparity, this disparity study that we've been talking about and dragging our feet on forever because that actually has a local element to it um, where it gives a little bit of an edge to local and women and you yes. know minority businesses. So we have been very slow in the um, movement towards that, but that would which be is, very helpful. Which is, I think, another 
you know, it doesn't look good. This thing's been dragging on at least since I've been up here. Back on that. And it's never going to happen that, if we don't do it. Is that something you can do, or does that create too much of a time frame no, no, no. issue for them to not have cleaning? I'm, I'm just trying. I just wanted to have a discussion to sure. get a feeling for how the commission feels about these kind of situations. I understand. I appreciate the feedback. I, I can tell you that the thought process behind um, um, bringing it forward was that we currently have a comprehensive janitorial services contract. Correct. And the, um, the cost of administering, it's less contract administration to have all the services and we uh, maximize economies of scale, utilizing one um, vendor to manage all the services. So ideally, that's sort of best procurement practices. Right. Instead of having multiple contracts to administer citywide, we have a comprehensive, we have one point of contact for all of the services. But if it's the- So is this part of one of, they're, they're all across our city doing work and this is just correct. one aspect? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. That's, that was they the- clean here, they're cleaning so this, in the And our small businessmen and women are never gonna get in. Oh, maybe never. not. Look, in the future, maybe we say break this contract down because this is something we could have local businesses do, breaking it into four parts. It's a substantial contract. It's over a million dollars. So we, that could be something we consider. I just wanted to start to have the discussion. Okay. This is the second time I've seen janitorial come through on the consent, and I just think there are people locally that could be doing these jobs. Thank you for your efforts. If we could uh, provide you an update on the diversity disparity study. I believe um, we are currently uh, negotiating. We are in negotiations with the number one ranked firm, and we hope to have a an agreement. Bless you. Um, hopefully, at an upcoming September meeting. Okay. We are currently negotiating. We actually um, met with the firm last week, so the discussions are ongoing, and it's we are moving as promptly as we can. Right, it's very, it's very involved, this undertaking, so we are mm -hmm. on it. You know, we're hoping that, that you know, they will provide us a pathway forward mm -hmm. because I know the challenge sometimes is with insurance requirements. Um, and background checks. And, and right. sorry. That. <laughs> and what? Well, back, background checks. So, oh, yeah. you know, they, because they also service the police department, oh. it does become, it poses challenges. I mean, I think they needed some type of clearances at some point. So just for, for everyone's edification, this is just adding an additional component to a contract right. that's already in place. Understood. So that's why it's probably it's on consent. Expeditious. It's already been approved. Okay. So, but if that's the will of the commission, this was an RFP too. I don't think it was a piggyback. Correct. So we actually put out a solici okay. solicitation on this. Okay. All right, I will then I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Call the roll, please. Thank you for the information. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston? Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. You must be up in the mountains or something. <laughs> All right, so we're moving on to 7CC, which was removed from the consent agenda as item 6B. This was uh, removed by the vice mayor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, when I saw this, I was a little um, puzzled. I a year or so ago knew that there was something going on that we were working. Is now exiting. <laughs> I don't blame him. Uh, oh, sugar. <laughs> I knew you were going to say something. This is, wow. this is a tough subject. Uh, it's only been, I think, one or two years that we dissolved this type, the same um, cooperation, if I remember correctly, for whatever the reason. And we're back again, but I'm not quite sure because, unfortunately, I didn't uh, get a meeting to say what was going on. And if I was invited, I apologize for not attending. So I just wondered if we could at least talk about what this one is, not to talk about the last one, and how we're going to move forward and not have the same situation five years from now. Well, that sounds perfect because I don't really know anything about the last one since I've only <laughs> been here for right. two months. Sarah, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Sarah Maxfield, Economic Development Director for the City of Delray Beach. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. 
Um, so when I first started two months ago, one of the first things that Jennifer and Duncan asked me to do was take over this effort to cooperatively work with our downtown um, development association, I'm sorry, downtown development authority and the Greater Delway Chamber um, to address um, some needs when it comes to marketing our tourism and um, destination uh, businesses and and industry here which is huge it's a huge part of our city industry um, there was a uh, had been conversations had been had from my understanding and at some point in the last year year and a half commission had uh, directed uh, the city to work with the chamber and with the DDA to um, help bolster some efforts in, in an attempt to um, combat some of the challenges that came with COVID. And that's really all the background I know of this. Um, I can tell you from the moment that I've come, uh, um, Stephanie from the chamber and Laura from the DDA and myself, as well as oversight from Duncan and Jennifer have worked closely to develop um, an agreement, a cooperative agreement to administer a program um, that is actually an existing DDA program that's very successful in marketing um, the downtown development district, but expanding that program for the benefit of all of the city of Delray Beach by bringing in the partners and all of the um, assets that we could combine to leverage. So that's where we are today. Um, it was no small feat to get all of the different board members from both of the organizations, as well as protect the city's interest in hammering out this agreement, and we have, um, we have succeeded in that. So uh, if there are any other questions that you had specific to that, I'm happy to do my best to answer. Laura's also here on hand to talk more specifically about the program, if you care to hear. Yes, I and, would. And Stephanie as well, so. I think they're gonna understand what I'm looking for you, in their presentation. Why don't you give them a hint? <laughs> That's a well, great question. I wanna see if they were gonna read my mind. Not that good. Oh, yeah. Um, good evening or good afternoon. Laura Simon with the Downtown Development Authority. And um, it would be helpful if there's any specific questions. Um, but how I'll is this, How is this organization, this plan, going to differ from what we just eliminated? So this, so the agreement, if that's what, the agreement itself has been put in place for us to um, have in writing, if you will, to or us a... Um, form that we could now move forward with jointly uh, in efforts, um, really just more for a binding agreement for that to have go forward with a, a plan. So we have a plan as far as a tourism marketing plan that will allow us to now be augmented with the efforts of the city and the funding for the efforts uh, to help with that, as well as just the resources to help us move forward to really focus on the marketing efforts uh, tourism marketing efforts as it relates to advertising um, really to help our um, recovery efforts as we come out of the pandemic. This started, if you remember, back last summer, we met jointly with you all individually to walk through the very important need to have a strong marketing program for our city as we've come through this pandemic uh, on a successful way. The state did a tremendous effort uh, through Visit Florida's efforts to k stay constant through the pandemic, which has led to the success of our state um, and our city and our partnership with the county, as well as the efforts of the Downtown Development Authority, the city, the chamber, the CRA, and all of our private industry to stay strong through this time to really lead us in a place right now where we are successful. We are seeing um, very successful occupancy numbers. However, we still have a long way to go. And for us to be even uh, more impactful, it is important for us as a downtown, especially for the Downtown Development Authority and our mission to drive the economic recovery for our, our, our gem that we have here. It's important for us to also work collectively with the city to make sure that our, our city as a whole shines. So your question about how does this differ, it's a different time. It's different and it's, it's a, a charge for us to, um, we have, built as a downtown development authority our organizations built a very strong marketing program we have very uh, very strong reach 
and with the um, us and our team administering that with the partnership with the city and the chamber it'll lead us into a, a whole new place so, so you're not looking at another um, in a local agreement that's going to eventually perhaps change into some separate entity that's going to have a board that <laughs> no 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 this is that's more what i was coming uh, yeah to say. yeah it's yeah. not a separate, I'm, I'm not a separate entity not this wanting is to go really down that path again okay. yeah and i think it was more no not at all i think we're not looking to um create a whole nother separate entity such as the Dari beach marketing cooperative this is for us to now have a, an agreement that outlines specifically how this plan works in, um, in a partnership way. So after, after you've spent this effort, do you intend to maybe have it continue to grow or you're gonna say, is, I just don't see a time limit in this. I, it's just a one year? Is it a one-year agreement? So, Vice Mayor, it is a one-year agreement. There are, um, I believe, two opportunities to renew. Um, and what we plan to do is um, take this baby step, see how well it works. If it works well for all involved and we feel like as a city um, we are enhancing and providing something to our citizens um, by joining this effort, will continue with it. It will be dependent on the budgeting process. The money that comes to support these efforts will come out of the economic development budget. So it will um, it will be dependent upon that budget cycle of a year and what we have and, and what we feel is working and not. We're, we're doing our best to be nimble in this effort to accommodate all of the different partners and to give the, um, the entire community a really uh, much better opportunity to shine. Okay, I'm a little confused about the, the community, uh, perhaps the businessmen, I can see. Um, by providing income through tourism, I can see the city as a whole shining. Um, I'm just very concerned that this doesn't go back retro to what we've just dug ourselves out of, and that this doesn't, um, I guess there's, I'm looking for a different way to have this happen, but if this is the only way, then I guess that's the only way. I don't know. Can I have a comment? Um, I think it's great to have partnerships and commitments, um, but to me, if you're going to spend $105,000, I think it should be spent in areas west of Swinton. Downtown, it's packed. You don't have to do anything. Well, the we are not. Well, we're not, not spending 105. Excuse me. Excuse me. It's spending on the beach is packed. Down in that area, you can't get any more people. But what to me, what I see suffering is west of Swinton, west of Congress, you know, in between Cong Swinton and, and, and military, those businesses aren't getting the foot traffic that we get down here. And I think, and the, I think the DDA does a great job yes. uh, doing that and promoting our downtown through no help uh, from their county partners who uh, ignore South County, and I'm just gonna continue to say that, uh, <laughs> but it's empty years, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. But to me, as, as an economic engine, we need to, Focus on the areas west of Swinton, in between, you know, Lytton and whatever. Downtown, you're, you guys are doing a great job, but uh, just to, to focus. But I, I think it's good that it's a specialized thing. And by the way, the Delray Affair in Boynton, I heard, was awesome. It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm again. sorry, Bob. Bob, I'm sorry. Again. Thank so you. If, if I, that. if I, I may, that. Mayor. Oh, sorry. Well, I can answer that. I think for you. Which a part? Bit. This is why. <laughs> The Delray Let's Affair with being awesome. Let's, let's start with West. Wait, the ghost of the DBMC has risen. Yes. <laughs> I know. You can't get rid of me. But this is where this is where the chamber comes Stephanie, in. Stephanie, could you uh, okay. announce yourself? Please. Sorry, this is where the chamber comes announce in. Announce yourself, too. Yourself. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm Stephanie Immelman, and I'm CEO of the Delray Beach Chamber. I thought everybody knew that. Sorry. So um, this is why it's such a great partnership, because we can all work together. This is where the chamber comes in. We, fo we have a concerted effort focusing on not only west of Swinton, but west of Congress, out through military, and that's where it encompasses the whole city. Obviously, the downtown is the jewel of our city, but we want all of the city to be like that. And the DDA has come up with an excellent branding that I love, by the way, and I can't wait for all of us to use it and all of us to speak with the same voice, voice and be on brand. So that's why working together makes sense. Thank you. Do you want to clarify? Anything else? I don't understand how the DDA can work west of 
They, they can. I think that I think this is a this is a um, this is a kind of like a collaborative um, you know effort, um, and I think that that's what is really going on here. And in fact, it it kind of I guess fills the the void that the DBMC used to do. I presume in a certain way, they would be able to market all <coughs> the entire city, whereas the DDA has to be very specific. As does the CRA. There is limitations as to where they can spend money. And um, that has to do with their districts. Whereas when you're talking about what we're talking about with their economic development, it's everywhere. So I think that they're just trying to work in, in you know, in joint effort. Exactly. Right yes. So exactly. So I mean, benefiting the economic development of our, our downtown and our entire city. I mean, this is a destination campaign. So it's de it's showcasing the destination as a whole. Delray Beach as a whole, I mean, it's marketing, you know, Coca-Cola. So, I mean, again, you're not marketing individual entities. We're mar marketing our entire city, bringing awareness, you know, competing with the millions of cities around the, the country and the, in the world. You know, we want Delray Beach to be the number one choice, and we want it to benefit all, whether you're on Linton, military, or Atlantic Avenue. It's, 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 we want, the, the goal is to make our city shine and um, and do it in a way that is in one voice and has a very strong um, unity around it. So mm -hmm. we will, as part of this agreement, is be sharing with you the results. I mean, we've devised a plan that will, as we always do, is just share with you the um, metrics around that, continue to show where we're targeting. And it's all based on data that we've developed over the years as why we've selected the direction that we're going based on the data from our county and our state that where people are traveling, visitor traffic, where they're coming from, and where we can continue to grow. How, how much are we, I, I didn't write it down, how much are we uh, voting on today? Yes, ma'am, it's $65,000. 15 of that is actually going um, to a, a tourism uh, master marketing plan where we'll be looking at uh, areas besides the downtown area, but some of the other pockets of our city that are um, in need of marketing as well. And then the additional 50 will be used to support um, various efforts, again, uh, so that we can expand outside of the downtown. since. The DDA is required to spend its funding for the downtown. The city's dollars can be used for outside of that. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Obtain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. All right. We've got Ryan. <laughs> All right. Call the roll, please. Mr. Boston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Da -da -da. Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yeah. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Okay, moving on to uh, regular agenda item 7A, which is resolution 103-21. This is a quasi-judicial item, so I'm going to read the quasi-judicial rules into the um, record. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with the quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person representing an organization or a group of people are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, city commission staff and the applicant will be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not be legally made upon the personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the required law, the comprehensive plan, the land development re regulations. Um, at this point in time, if there's anybody here that is going to be speaking to resolution 103-21, please stand and raise your hand and you will be sworn in um, as a witness. Okay, this has to do with an easement off of, I want to say, um, where is this? Is this off of? 115 um, Fox Point Circle. Fox Point, yeah, Fox Point Circle. Um, is there any ex parte communication by the commission? We'll start with Commissioner Cassell. None. I'm aware. Deputy Vice Mayor? None. 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 Vice Mayor. Um, Commissioner Boylston? None. And none from me. So, staff, will you enter the file into the record? 
Um, Anthea Genotis Development Services Director for the record. Um, I'd like to enter file 2021-011. Uh, Mr. Goldberg is here with a just quick description of the request and then I'll follow up with some analysis. Very good. The applicant can step forward, state your name and you have the floor. Paul Goldberg, 515 Fox Point Circle, Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, looking for an abandonment of a utility easement on my property so I can construct uh, a new home. Okay. So I'll give you a couple of graphics um, to work off of. This is the location. It's on the east corner of Hamlet Drive in Fox Point Circle. It's a quarter acre lot. It's an R1A zoning district um, and it's a single family residential house. So it, this is actually, um, the, the property line is actually here. The area does have um, different utility easements for drainage and other things and they go all the way around. The request before you is only for a portion just this inner portion um, to be abandoned, which is not um, currently being used for utilities. So the remainder of the easements remain intact. And so it is a, a sliver, I think it's a 672 square foot sliver. Um, um, it was dedicated um, ultimately for utilities and drainage as, and is not needed for utilities at this time. Um, the city engineer has reviewed the request and has recommended approval and uh, pursuant to LDR section 246N5, the finding before you is that the abandonment doesn't result in a detriment for the pr provision of utility services to the adjacent property or the general area. And okay, and it. if you have any questions, hopefully he can help. All right, so um, right now we're gonna go to um, anybody in the public that may wanna speak uh, to or for or against. Seeing no one, public comment is closed. Back to the cross-examination and rebuttal testimony by either um, the applicant or the, st the city staff. Do we have any rebuttal testimony or cross-examination? No, you're okay with everything else. Yep. Okay, to the board. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor yes. Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. All right, very good. That was a quick and easy quasi-judicial hearing. Probably the easiest one we've ever had. So moving on to ratification of emergency regulations. This will be quick too. Motion to approve. Second. <laughs> Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Wollston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay, moving on to 7C, nomination for appointment to the Education Board. If everyone remembers, this was the board um, that we changed off because there were some questions. So we are now at, um, we are good. So we're going to start with uh, Mr. Boylston. You have um, a nomination. You're first. Yes, I'd like to reappoint Penny Butler. Second. Okay, any comments, concerns, questions? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Next would be Vice Mayor. Yes, I'd like to move the name of Kend Ms. Kendra Williams. Second. Okay. Any co comments, concerns? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Next would be my pick, and I'm going with um, uh, Karen Cipristine Klein. Second. Any questions, concerns? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Okay, moving on to um, Deputy Vice Mayor Frankel. Question, Marjorie Walded, Waldo, did we appoint her to a board at the last meeting? No. Okay, so. I'll move her name then. Which one are we on? We have a second? Oh, second, sorry. Okay. Yes. Any questions, concerns? None. Seeing none, call the, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. W Mr. Boylston? Yes. Okay, moving on to Commissioner Cassell. Um, I will select Mitch. Second. Thank you. Okay, any comments or concerns, questions? Seeing none, call the roll. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And, uh, Commissioner Boylston, you have uh, the final pick. Yes, I'd like to appoint Spitzer. 
Second. Any questions, concerns? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Moving on. It's another board of Palooza. Is that what they called it on the? Mm -hmm. All right. Nomination for appointment on the police advisory boards begins with uh, Commissioner Boylston. Yes. I'd like to move the name Newbolt. Second. Okay. Any, any comments? Seeing none, call the roll. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. And finally, to Vice Mayor? Yes, I'd like to nominate Streitzer. That's a surprise. Yes. <laughs> All right, call the roll, please. What's Streitzer's first name? No idea. <laughs> 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 the only one left on the list. <laughs> okay. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. All right. And, and I'd like then to we're put a plug um, in right green... here, Mayor. May I? Yes. This is why it's very important that those of you who have a moment, a day, a time, please volunteer for our boards. We only had two choices. That's what the joke is about. There are only two. Okay, so moving on to 7E, which is nomination for the Green Implementation Board, and that is uh, falls to the Vice Mayor again. Oh, I'm sorry. I believe you had pushed this one off from last week. Yes. Um, I do know the name of this nominee. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. Ms. Isabel Eve, let me pronounce it, Seckler. Hmm? Seckler? Second. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. All right, very good. So now we are up to 7F, which is fiscal year 20, 2022 proposed millage rate. Mr. Leggy. Good evening, Mayor Commissioners. Uh, John Leggy, Finance Director. This next agenda item is a request to set the preliminary uh, millage rate for fiscal year 22. The uh, property appraiser is required to provide taxable values to the city by the July 1st of every year and on the 24th of June, uh, he did provide those, uh, those uh, estimates. The preliminary taxable value for the city for next year is $12.5 billion. That represents a $636 million increase, or 5.35%. Uh, of interest in that $636 million increase, about $147 million of that comes from new construction. And if you look at all the municipalities within the Palm Beach County, uh, that ranks fifth on the list in, the, uh, in new construction uh, for all of the municipalities within the city. Going back and looking over the last 10 years of taxable values, you can see that in 2012, in column four, the city of Delray Beach had a taxable value of 6.1 billion. And if you follow that all the way down to 22, the 12.5 billion that I just uh, mentioned uh, represents almost a, oh, more than double over the last uh, 10 years. That represents, again, a 5.4% increase. Uh, one of interesting notes, if you look in the last column, that is the percentage of Delray Beach to Palm Beach County, and you can see that that's stayed pretty consistent through the years. So Delray Beach has, has stayed consistent as far as the increases along with the other municipalities and the county itself. Pictorially, if you look at this uh, graph uh, uh, from the chart, you can see the, the blue chart that the taxable values have increased again, uh, but the um, orange line shows the year-over-year -year percent increase, and you can see that uh, as we came out of the Great Recession in 2012, uh, with actually a negative growth at that point in time, you see that uh, there was a real, uh, you know, quick to the 10.2% in 2016, and then there's been year-over-year -year increase, but it's been at a slower pace down to the 5.4% for this current year. From a millage rate standpoint, uh, you can see that uh, the, the operating millage and the debt service millage, the debt service millage services are general obligation bond issues, and I'll talk a little bit about debt service in a minute. Uh, that's the total millage in the right-hand column, and from 2012 to 2021, the millage rate has decreased about 12.2%, or almost a mil during that period of time. 
from a graph standpoint, you can see that uh, over the years it has steadily uh, decreased, uh, you know, somewhere between a tenth of a, a mil uh, over the last 10 years. The debt service millage is, uh, is required to service the general obligation bonds. We have two outstanding general obligation bonds who, that mature in fiscal year 24, so we have three more years of payments on those general obligation bonds. The taxable value for the debt service is $12.5 billion. Uh, the required debt service payment for next fiscal year, fiscal year 22, is $2.1 million. So that will require debt service millage of 0 0.0792. That's down from, 0 .0, from uh, 0 0.0886 in the previous year. A couple of scenarios, if you look at the different options for millage rate, at the current millage rate of 6.611, uh, that will bring in $80.5 million to the general fund. The CRA contribution will be $16.1 million. For actually a general fund, then we'll actually see $64.4 million, which would be a $3.4 million increase from the current year. If you increase the millage rate to, by one-tenth of a percent to 6 7611 that would bring in a projected uh, ad valorem of $81.7 million with 16.3 to the CRA for a total to the general fund of $65.3 million, which would be a $4.4 million increase. If you decrease the millage rate by 0.1, it would take it to 6.5611. Recognized revenue would be $79.3 million. Contribution to the CRA would be $15.8 million with $63.4 million to the general fund, which is a 2.45 increase. The rollback rate, the rollback rate is the rate that is required to bring in the same revenue from the previous year. The, re the rollback rate is calculated at 6.4010, which would bring in 77 million, 15.5 to the CRA, 61.9 to the general fund, which would be a decrease, or an increase of $696,000 to the general fund. So staff's recommendation is set the operating millage at 6.66, which is the current millage rate, and the debt service millage at 0.1792 for a total of 6.8403, which would be uh, not 0 0.0094 reduction from the current millage rate. The budget workshop we talked about would be on the 24th, and then the public hearings on September 10th and September 21st. And Commissioner, as we talked about, uh, if we changed that to September 13th, we did look at September 23rd, and that seems to be a date that we could do on September 23rd. Okay. So we could change those two public hearings to September 13th and September 23rd, make our advertising deadlines, and be able to comment in. With that, I answer any questions that you may have. And for those who are here that were not part of the workshop meeting, we had a 5 o'clock Friday um, afternoon meeting scheduled for the first budget hearing that... Um, the deputy vice mayor mentioned and we all agreed with it wasn't a, an ideal time so we've switched that to the two new times giving us the opportunity still to be able to um, have the timing to advertise should there be any changes okay. just to make sure that everybody understands uh, to the commission want to start on this end do you want to start it doesn't matter I'll start. Okay go right ahead. Go ahead. No I mean I, I know that the commission has a goal uh, every year to decrease millage rate by a, a tenth of a mil. And at that slide, I believe it's slide number eight, that still brings approximately two and a half million uh, increase. That means people's taxes are still going up. Um, I, I would like to see some kind of decrease, particularly with the increase in the fees that will be coming in, in my view, uh, now that we're out of COVID or almost out of COVID, as well as the federal funds that we can anticipate we have any idea of the millions of dollars that we're going to be getting from yeah. federal assistance? Ten. Ten million. Ten million. Five this year. Uh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> so in, in that regard, I, I'd like to see a, a decrease of at least a, a, a tenth going forward. Thank you. Commissioner Cassell? I would like to see a decrease too, but some of the things that concern me is some of the voting. You know, when we voting, we're voting on how we have to follow up with this. And my main concern is we experienced a change in the level of service at our own direction. Um, but, you know, we, we sat up here, we heard a lot of complaints about 
different things going on in the city. And, you know, that was due to staffing changes. So, I mean, I feel like I'm up here voting for ultimately a decrease, but generally speaking, I don't know what that looks like in terms of how we're servicing our residents, and that concerns me. So I would like to hear what you all have to say. I'll, I'll um, defer let's go to, to um, Commissioner Boylston. Thank you, Mayor. I also want to get back on track of lowering it um, by 0.1 every year. I know we took, took a break from that plan, uh, and rightfully so, last year. And now we just have to decide on whether or not that was that was enough. Speaking with staff, it sounds like we're not out. We're not out of the woods. Yes, we're getting ten thousand dollars, ten million dollars from um, from the uh, federal package, but we're going to see a shortfall of close to that amount in revenues over the over the two year span of COVID. So, um, I think the consideration is whether or not to keep the current millage or to get back on track with the years prior of decreasing it by by point one. I also wanted to have that conversation with you today because the number one thing that I hear um, in and aligned with Commissioner Casal is an increase in the, the quality of life and the quality of service in our city. It's the number one thing I hear and I don't know if we'll be strapped to do so if we um, if we continue to lower the, the millage during these times. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Vice Mayor. Very good. Thank you, Mayor. I'm consistent, if nothing else, but consistent. I have never liked the role, the decrease, because we're constantly giving, giving, giving. And I so appreciate your comments, Commissioner Cassell. We, in rolling back by even a tenth of a percent, we are constantly doing things that I believe jeopardize us in our security. We cut out we eliminated three police positions, police officer positions. We're not even talking about bringing those back without the, the uh, amount that our finance director just talked about. So if we don't agree to what he's saying, we're eliminating those permanently. And I don't know about you, but there seems to be a, I don't even know how to describe it. There is a, disturbance, a civil disturbance in the air. And coming out of COVID, people have been a little bit strange, and I don't know what to contribute it to. And if we don't, in my opinion, increase our security, we might be a little uh, regretful of not having had a little forethought about it. We just increased or, or came to a settlement with our firemen and there are things that we just had presented to us, um, not a very large shortfall, but now we're talking about taking up the, um, the audit report. We never take these things into consideration when we're rolling back. Um, I've never liked the way we've done this. I can't fight City Hall, but uh, I, I, I just like to go back to what we were, and this time I've put a little number down there. I believe we were, and you'll have to take it back to the number of years. That way. One more. There you, yeah. One more. There you are. There you go, thank you. Um, I know I'm gonna be laughed out of the water, but I'd like to go back to what, where we were at on 2019. And we can always raise it, I mean, sorry, we can always lower it once we come to some agreement, but we should set it at something that we can live with. And what we put down today, if I'm not mistaken, we can't go higher. Right. We can only go lower. Create the ceiling. So why not go at a higher number and then lower it as we've, as, as I've been convinced or as we're going to convince ourselves that we can live with it. We haven't even begun our contractual um, negotiations with our police department or our general employees. We never take these things into consideration. I love, I'd love to tell the citizens, we're going to reduce it 
tenth of a mil, uh, ten, one tenth, one tenth, one tenth. Every year we're going to go down. We're going to go down. But the city's growing, the needs are growing, but we are not always going to be at a point where our property values are going to um, suffice to take care of the new demands that are constantly on us. And also keep in mind, this is my last comment, when we decrease these numbers, we're also decreasing our CRA funding. And we, I pray and hope, are about to have a building explosion. And there's going to probably need to be a lot of assistance, maybe even some ex um, development ourselves, the CRA doing it without having to go out. So with all of that said, let's just think not to do something that we cannot go um, decrease from or increase from. So my suggestion would be to make it 6.9403. OK. Oh, you're talking about the full? Um, with yes, the, the full with amount, 6.7611. Yeah, that's the, the mill rate you're looking at. Yeah. Well, I mean, I rate. was part of the group that basically made that decision back in 2014. Actually, it was probably 13, 14. Um, I want to say that uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Frankel, or Deputy Vice Mayor Frankel, was um, sitting alongside when we made the decision to incrementally drop um, one-tenth of a mil over the next 10 years. That would bring us out to 2020, believe four, because I think that's when we started that, that process, or thereabouts, it might have been 2020, um, it might have been 2015. Um, and that had to do with the fact that our millage rate was, was really soaring as compared to speaking our neighbors, neighboring communities, and um, it just seemed to just constantly go up. If we can go back to the screen that, um, the, uh, the one that had the actual amounts on it. Uh, there. With the little bar graph. Yeah, the, the, what, we have, what we have in front of us. If you look at the current millage rate at um, the 6.66 line, and you'll notice that the um, projected um, revenues are 80 million. And um, what the increase would be would be about 3.4. And then you go down to the decrease of the one the one tenth of a mil that we have promised our citizens. Um, you are looking at really basically a one million dollar difference between um, the 80 million dollars that we're getting into 79 million dollars, or what the increase is actually at the very uh, end of it is 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 really about one million dollars. I'm telling you, with a budget of that figure of $80 million, if we cannot find a million dollars to continue to, um, you know, give back or, you know, look at this from the standpoint of what we had promised, then something doesn't seem to make sense to me. It's a very, very small amount. It's minute when you compare it to what we're actually gaining. And to me, it, 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 it actually does help um, when we are able to keep money in the pockets of our residents. It helps our economy. It, it just, it makes sense to me to try to make sure that our government operates um, efficiently. And the more you give, the more, the less efficient it feels that the operations happen. That's just my, my own personal opinion. Um, I don't really foresee that a million dollars is going to make the difference between a level of service that we aren't already receiving or that we could feel the difference of, and I think that we should keep the promise. And let me also say one other thing. Over the last 10 years, I believe it was, that you said that we had doubled, okay? We have not doubled in our, in our constituency. I mean, we have grown by a fraction. So to have been able to do it so well then and to have be struggling today, and I know we are struggling because what we have done is we have built that, I mean, when you were sitting around talking about at the last meeting, um, the workshop meeting about the pension um, uh, part of our, our liability, it's growing by leaps and bounds. So that is putting us in a predicament. But I think that it is our responsibility to operate, from my perspective, more efficiently as we move forward. We are not gaining a tremendous number of people in our town. We haven't grown by the amount that would say that we should have gone 
twofold. I mean, we have doubled in the amount of money that are that's coming in. But that money, for the most part, is promised out to a lot of the, the commitments that we've made. And that's the thing that I think that is the, the, the warning sign of what we are continuing to do. We've made commitments in this past year that are going to cost this city big time into the future. That eight-year drop program, things like this that actually um, creating a new um, group that now is a, their own union that we're now going to have to deal with uh, um, in the in the in the um, in the fire department. These are things that are costing our city that I'm sorry, but make it very difficult for us to be able to do some of the things that we want to do. And I don't think it should be the burden of the, the responsibility of the people for having to make these decisions, I think we have to learn how to be better about handling the money. We've got enough, trust me. And we also have a good, strong reserve, which helps me to feel more comfortable if something comes up in the year, as has happened this past year. We have a reserve fund to call, pull from. There's more than a million dollars in there to be able to utilize in the event that we need to. So to me, I want to see that cap put on. I want to see us stick to our promise. And that's where I kind of stand. I, I made that promise uh, eight years ago. And by the you time I'm out of here, it. I'm going to hopefully have delivered on that promise. That's the way I see it. And I, and we, and I actually didn't do it last year because it wasn't right to do. We were in a very unchartered territory, and we kept it the same. And again, the more money we can keep in people's pockets, the more money they're going to spend out, and it gives them that you know ability to be able to keep our, our economy going. It all works hand in hand. So that's where I stand. So if you want to make a motion, um, we can do Mayor that. I, Mayor, if I may. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, no, just, like just, just a couple of points. One, uh, earlier today, I showed you a slide that shows you right now where we are in the general fund. Without adding any level of service increases, we're at a $7 million uh, deficit. So uh, backing off another million, we'll put that at, at the $8 million deficit range. And so, again, earlier today I told you I think there's three ways to balance the budget, increase revenues, reduce expenditures, or use reserves. Reduce uh, expenditures. Uh, reduce expenditures. That's and, right. And, That's right. And, 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 and I get that. The, uh, you know, $7 million is certainly, uh, to reduce that, certainly going to go back into the vacant positions that we, were, that we had in this current year. They're going to have to come back in. Some of the level of service, the training and the travel and all those things are going to have to be on the table. Probably about 75% of our uh, expenditures in the general fund are personnel related. Mm -hmm. So when you're cutting, you're, you're cutting people. Um, just, so, just so you know. Well, it's not Only cutting people. We're just not increasing. And that is probably our biggest nut, you know, as far as what well, we're. The, the $7 million would be cutting people. Well, we uh, have the, a $10 million right. ARA com ARP coming in, right? Right. Okay. Right, right. So that, so that for one time, one time only. That's a one time, but, yes. Right, right. But when you use money one time and you go through that, then the next year you have to make up. And the next year, the next year we happen to get five point four million. Right. So I just want to make you know that clear. We have we haven't negotiated with the police, so you know mm -hmm. whatever that's going to be the general employees. So there are some things coming down the line. So um, you know that's I just want to put that on the record that you're going to have to, you're, you're probably going to get no level of service, so you're going to get no increases, and then you're going to take no the level of service what does that no, mean? no increased level of service because that's the 3.8 million that we talked about today mm -hmm. that departments have asked for additional equipment additional mm -hmm. personnel I mean if, if you're trying to balance the budget that's probably out of the question uh, you're, you're going back to that seven million dollar deficit at the current level of service and then if you start to cut out seven million then you're going to start cutting you know personnel so are we going to restore the three police positions that we eliminated last year I'm not aware of the three police uh, positions. Are you able to speak to that, Duncan? Uh, unfortunately, not at this point. Uh, you know, this this is almost the cart before the horse. Unfortunately, I know it always is. is every year. I, I know. you know I've hated this process since I started in government because this is a very important uh, communication to the residents who mm -hmm. obviously pay our salaries and who elect you. However, you haven't had the opportunity to pick and choose what should make it into the next budget. That's why the administration's view is always to set it higher than even you intend to so that when you have all the options on your table, then you can figure out what is really important to you and then we can sort of back into that millage. And if it's still not comfortable for you, we can look at some reductions from there. 
but to tie the hands of the administration with a lower mill millage doesn't give you, the commission, the options come August 24th. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is, is when you say tie the hands and you're talking about a million dollars out of $80 million budget, I'm sorry, if that's tying the hands and something's wrong here, that's what I'm trying to say. It sounds like what you're saying to us is that basically we, we're not going to get anything more now because of the million dollars. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking about? We've got an $80 million budget or revenue stream that we're expecting to come in. And you're saying that this is absolutely the beat all end all going to tie the hands of it. What I'm saying to you is that I don't care what we do. If we end up giving you the seven, the the six point seven six, as uh, the vice mayor says to give you, there is no way we are going down from that. It is every single year. We, what we set right now is what you're going to be, you know, working towards, and that that's fair. It, it's the right way to do it because now you have something to work towards. You know, I'm just saying that you know, if we do the seven point of uh, the six point seven six as the mill rate, that's the mill rate that I'm telling you we're going to have to vote on the budget hearing because everything's going to be based on that number and so what I'm saying is is that I I just want I I don't I, I feel the way that we should be doing it is what we made as a promise and I think we should be able to do it on 80 million dollars Mayor, can anyway. I just put Mayor, Mayor. yes 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 um I I would and I and I think I say this every year except for last year I would like to see what that what that million dollars um, is like what it actually ends up being. And that's why I've always advocated for in this, in this first reading of the setting of the millage of going with staff's recommendation. Now I understand some, you know, some of my colleagues, I know you say, well, it's really hard to back it down after that, but I, I, I don't, I don't agree. I want to see what 6.76 looks like and what 6.66 looks like. And I want to be able to make that make that decision. If we set it today at the at the 6.66, we don't we don't even get to consider keeping it keeping it flat. I'm sorry, that's 6.56 and 6.66. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't even get to see what that what, what we're actually cutting for that million for that million dollars. That could that could be five two hundred thousand dollar projects that our uh, our constituents have come to us and have said that is very, very important. Um, and we were just in that goal setting meeting and we were making a long list of things that we needed to get done. So I would at least like to set today the millage of 6.66 as staff is recommending. But I would like to um, to communicate to the staff that I want to see what that million dollars is. If we're going to make that cut and try to stick to this decrease of a tenth of a mil every year, which I want to get back on track with too, Mayor. I want to finish what you started. Um, but I want to know what what is it that I'm cutting? Okay. Anybody? Yeah, have I just want to. I just want to let the commission know that you do have you approved one collective bargaining agreement tonight, right. and there are still two that are pending: the police and the SEIU. So we anticipate that there are going to be shade meetings or executive sessions on those um, in the foreseeable future. Um, so, you know, remember what you're doing today is you're setting the cap. Mm -hmm. You can always go down be below that. You can, but if you set it, if you set it at a lower rate, that's going to be your cap. So, you know, I would just hate that, you know, these are contractual obligations that you have on um, these collective bargaining agreements that last for several years. So I would hate for you to set something very low and then have other services suffer because of that contractual obligation. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Appreciate that. I motion? Anybody? Sure. I'll, I'll do a motion to uh, set the millage rate at 6.5611 for operating and 0.1792 for debt services. I'll pass the gavel and uh, second it. Wait, tell me what, go to the other screen and tell me. The gavel goes to um, Vice Mayor Johnson. Decrease, 6.56. You're going to the 6.5, yeah, 6.5. Yep, and then the operate, that was the motion. Uh, so you're, you're I'm, I'm sorry sharing. sorry I've got the gavel <laughs> <laughs> I'm still thinking through it um, oh I have a motion and a second on the floor um, hold the roll please Mayor Petrolia yes Mr. Frankel yes Ms. Cassell no Mr. Boylston no Ms. Johnson no okay do we have a second motion? I'd like to make a motion to set the millage rate at 6.6611 Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? No. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? 
Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? <laughs> no. <laughs> I knew that was going to be tough. Oh Thank God. you, Commissioner Boylston. I was going to go one passes. more higher. So it's 6.6611. Uh, that was great. But <laughs> Thank you for your awful. comments because we did just go through that negotiation with a $4 million increase to the fire department over the course of two years. And that's kind of where we're, we're locked in here in so many ways. Our day-to-day -day decisions dictate what we need to be doing and here we tonight. We have two more that's to go. Correct. Correct. Yes, sir. We didn't include in the motion the debt service millage. Could we do that at one? Oh yes. Um, I'm sorry. Who who, mm. who made the motion? I'll make a motion to make the total um, six point eight four zero three. Is that with the with the debt service at point one seven nine two? One seven nine two. One seven nine two. Correct. Second. That. Second. Okay. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. No. Mr. Frankel. No. Okay, moving on to uh, 7G, which is fiscal year 2022 proposed millage rate for the uh, DDA. Hello, it's Laura. Hello, good evening. Um, again, Laura Simon, the Downtown Development Authority Executive Director. I am also here tonight with um, my board chair, Peter Arts, and my board treasurer, which is Mavis Benson, and um, my other board members are watching from afar. So. Um, so good evening tonight. We um, have before you at the, on the agenda, um, we set uh, at the June 14th DDA board meeting as per our statute, we, the board um, also is set as proposed, proposed millage at one mill, which is um, the highest our downtown development authority can levy. Uh, we do have, we have received uh, the taxable value for the DDA district this year to fund our operating budget. The taxable value is at $1.3 billion um, for the downtown uh, development area, which is 95 to A1A and our uh, four blocks on either side. This is, um, equates to the following, which is a $1.24 million uh, budget for, to operate our fiscal year 21-22 budget, which is approximately $8,000 increase over this current year. So we, while the city did see a 5.5% increase in value, the Downtown Development Authority District only received a 0.57 percent increase. So um, we do uh, anticipate new construction coming online in the coming year. However, uh, this current year, we are seeing a pretty flat uh, budget um, change for us to see as we go forward. So um, we did, we do look forward to bringing before you um, a full presentation. Our board did meet on June 21st at our goal setting meeting, setting priorities uh, for current con continuing priorities as well as new priorities for the coming year, as well as received several um, constituencies input. We obviously, as you know, we meet regularly with our, our down prop property owners and merchants to continue to hear from them and survey them on what is necessary for the coming year, as well as attending your goal setting meetings to again line our resources as we move in lockstep with the city. Um, we are preparing for a board workshop on July 26th, which would be a budget workshop to set our budget um, as we prepare for a final uh, budget review in August and then public hearing uh, along with the city in September. So with that, um, as you know, I provided you also with our current budget so you have an uh, opportunity to, the public has an opportunity to review our um, detailed line items as our areas of focus continue to be in marketing uh, and programming and events, as well as placemaking, which is our operational um, enhancements and amenities for the city in the downtown, which is our amenities, which are lights, banners, and then also our downtown safety ambassador program, as well as our economic vitality line item, which really services our um, business onboarding and um, our business development and retention and attraction and um, efforts that we work will also work in lockstep with the city on that as well. But it's been a huge effort and a huge lift for us this year and will continue to as we watch and manage the transition and some changes in development um, with 
uh, numerous new businesses and new entities coming into our community as we go forward. So, um, but we, I'm here, happy to answer questions, uh, but I look forward to bringing back a full presentation, hopefully on the August agenda, if I can get on there to share with you um, our plans for the coming year. Very good, to the commission. Any comments? This is for the one, one uh, mill. Motion to approve. Second. Um, by the way, uh, Laura, I just want to say you really, um, you know, did a great job through this whole pandemic uh, deal. And I just want to make mention to you and the board, um, you know, you. kudos to you. It, it, it really was, it made a huge difference to a lot of people who are possibly still in business because of some of the pivoting that you all did down in the, um, you know, in the, on the corridor there. Um, and I think that uh, it, it really shined, it shined a light on the greatness of our town. So I just want to say thank you for that. Thank and you. And also congratulations for your 50 years, too. Oh, so. great. Thank you. Um, Appreciate that. We have a motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Boston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on, 7H, um, this is the old school square um, uh, issue with respect to, I believe it's the build yes, or renovation, something. So right. good evening, Mayor, and Vice Mayor, Deputy Vice Mayor and Commissioners. The old school square is looking at uh, a lovely, ambitious project to, to renovate their reception area. And it's actually very, it's uh, multifold. And we uh, were lucky to get a tour this morning to uh, look at what was going on and their plans. And we felt it was important for you as the body that uh, oversees, you know, ultimately the, the uh, campus there to um, understand what they're, what they're doing, what they're planning on doing, and to uh, answer any questions that you may have on the process. Mayor, just, yes. just to be clear. Um, we're here today because the release agreement calls for written consent from the lessor. So I think there was some misunderstanding as to what what constitutes written consent. The the um, the lease agreement does state that a building permit would constitute consent. However, staff had concerns about the way that the application was completed, didn't agree with um, some of the representations that were made, and so when we became aware of this, we we saw the nature of the improvements. That's why this is an agenda item for your consideration. They are in the middle of construction. I think all of you have at least been made aware of it or have actually taken a tour. Um, so they were asked to stop work pending coming before the commission in order to obtain the proper consent pursuant to the lease agreement. All right, very good. And they are here to make a presentation. They are here to make a presentation. Okay, very good. So who's, there we go. Uh, Deborah Dowd, Vice Chairman of the Board at Old School Square. Francis Bork, uh, Chairman Emeritus of Old School Square. Um, I'd like to, if I may, I'd like to thank you so much for coming by and visiting today. All of you have been by and we really appreciate that. I think a picture is worth a thousand words, but being in place is worth a million. Uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, Deborah Dowd just in introduced herself, but I'd like to introduce three very special people at the moment. Uh, I will, in a little while, have the opportunity to tell you that we have members of Old School Square, former board members, current board members, but what I'd really like to do is cut to the chase and share with you with this beautiful project. We have a development team made up of Mr. DeSantis, who is our architect, Mr. Browning, who's on our board and our general contractor, and most importantly, our donor, Margaret Bloom. Margaret Bloom is the benefactor and has been involved in Old School Square from the museum to the current time. And I just want you to know that the city of Delray Beach is the beneficiary of many of her gifts. She isn't just a friend of Old School Square, she's a friend of South County and of Delray Beach. So with no further ado, I'd like to present our project. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of the commission, thank you very much. If I can figure out how to make this thing work. Ah, perfect. Uh, the project objectives. Uh, when, when we finished the museum, 
a few years ago. Uh, we, it, as I think you all have been there, and it's, it's a beautiful turnout, just a, a wonderful exhibit space. Uh, the, next, the next thing that Margaret chose to help us with and asked to help us with was, was uh, enhancing the Crest Theater building. And doing that by, by making it uh, first just a, 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 make it a better experience for our members and our guests and our visitors and also creating revenue opportunities. So as we got together, we put together a list of what the real objectives were. The first one was that you know, the place, what you see in there now was, was done in the early 90s, the interiors. So all the doors are from the early 90s. Uh, even before that, there was, a, there was no open lobby. There was a second floor on, on that. And so that was, that was taken out, opened up, but you know the carpet's 30 years old. Everything's 30 years old in there, and so we wanted to refresh it and, and enhance that for our visitors. Uh, the second is uh, uh, the, the seating areas have been added. You know, when you go into Old School Square, it's it's uh, congested in the in the lobby, and at an intermission, people don't really have a place to sit. They have to go out front into the driveway or or just move around it to to get away. But seating areas are being added. Uh, hands-free entry door. Uh, we have a lot of art students with easels and toolboxes with paintbrushes in them, and and so it's cumbersome because of the, those doors are only two foot two wide, and so we're uh, putting in automatic operators for those door for those doors, and we're also making uh, hands-free the plumbing fixtures, and and um, and and really bringing it up to to modern. Uh, to, to modern expectations. Uh, we are increasing the efficiency, the layout of the box office, the information desk, now to, to allow the staff to, to work more efficiently, and we're increasing our opportunities for revenue. Uh, <clears throat> the, we're building out a commercial kitchen off the Ocean Breeze Room, which will allow you know, rental opportunities, it will allow in-house catering instead of paying for, for outside. We, it allows for expanded concessionary. We have a serving counter on the back of the ocean breeze room now so that when there's a an event outside of the pavilion patrons can come in and cool off and, and enjoy a refreshment uh, we've opened up the second floor where before it was the balcony was circular and kind of walled off the fact that the, you know, there's a lot of activity that goes on on the second floor with our our classes or art classes that we have and really invites people to explore the building more we're adding new technology uh, and making the building more efficient. We've, we took out all the hi-hats downstairs in the corridors and in the ocean breeze room and uh, making those hi-hats LED. And um, we're putting in $100,000 worth of audiovisual enhancements that weren't there before. Uh, we're, this will enable us to uh, increase our programming with, our, with the culinary arts and it will also allow us to uh, introduce education to the local community. We have so many restaurants around to uh, have the, the Serve Safe program go on right there in our kitchen so that members of the community can participate. So that was the, the project objectives. And with that, uh, we called uh, Gino DeSantis out of the bullpen. Uh, Gino was our architect for the museum. Gino went to Carver Middle School and Atlantic High School, so he's been around for a while. And then uh, we let Gino go to work. So Gino. Thanks. Take it from here. Good evening. Thanks. And that was quite a few years ago. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, what, what I'm trying to do here now is just basically walk you through the renovation. I mean, the building is a two-story space. The ground floor has a couple of studio spaces and then some offices on the ground floor. The auditorium and main stage level, the orchestra level is on the ground floor. We're not going into those spaces, but we are moving throughout the remainder of the building. So with that, here's our floor plan. This is, you know, the western end of the building. You can see the entrance. Does this have a... The, the entrance to the building is at the bottom of the page. <clears throat> when you come in there right now or present or formerly, as you came in, there was a little reception desk off to the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. You know, this space is limited. When you really look at an arts venue, there's really no lobby space in here. It's all circulation. So what we're trying to do is make it 
comfortable so that during an intermission you don't have people going outside. So we tried to see, staying within the building envelope, how could we go ahead <clears throat> and get a, gain additional square footage. So that whole little area that's off to the left-hand side on the lower part of the page there, we're capturing that information desk or reception area and turning that into lobby space with some seating in there. Uh, as you come through, you know, when you walked into the building, you know, this is a two-story building and you really didn't even recognize the second floor. So what we're trying to do here is carry out some of the same vocabulary that we used over at the Cornell Theater and open it up with the glass to make it transparent so that as you're walking in, you're seeing people moving throughout the building. Uh, along the corridor that runs to the north-south there, you know, that there is basically a circulation space. But we, what we're trying to do is to capture some built-in seating areas so that the patrons have places to sit. I think in the original building, there might have been one bench for, you know, 280 patrons that visited the place. So in a nutshell, you know, that's basically uh, the difference here. You know, as Bill pointed out, you know, we're changing the majority or, or all of the light fixtures in the spaces that we're working in to more efficient LED type fixtures. So the next slide is, you know, the box office. You came in and there was a wall that just went up and it had a couple little windows that people had to peek through to see if anybody was in there. What we're trying to do is create more of a you know, personal interface between the patron and the, the staff member. So what we're doing is creating more of a countertop where now you're speaking to the person without a barrier in between you. And, you know, again, trying to fit everything within the confines. But what that also does is it creates more openness. You know, when you're coming into the space, you wind up not being confined by these walls. You're taking advantage of the windows that, you know, flood this space. So, you know, basically it'll just provide a little better uh, patron experience, hopefully. And then, you know, there's all of these brochures and pamphlets that all congregate right next to the door there. So what we're trying to do is move those away from there so that as you come through the front door, you transition through the lobby space. Underneath the stair, there's currently a concession area. It's not very big, and there's not much to gain either. But this concession area had a shutter in there that, you know, most of the time, you know, the building isn't occupied and this thing is closed. So what we tried to do was, again, to create a degree of openness in the lobby, and we made these openings much bigger. So on the two along the uh, narrower main entrance aisle, we have two five-foot wide windows. But again, in terms of creating a little more uh, you know, efficient service, because for a 15-minute intermission, you don't want somebody waiting 10 minutes online. These places also become income uh, generating uh, opportunities for people to go ahead and pick up a drink. But again, if people don't have the time to drink it because they're spending it mostly online, we trying to make that a little better. So we added another window on the, uh, on the auditorium, the east side of it, to provide better service and and reduce the, the uh, wait times. On the opposite side, we tried to do the same thing with creating a better degree of openness so that as you're coming down this corridor, you're not confined by the edge of the wall, but you can see through these spaces to see the corridor that connects along the, uh, the, the north-south there. So at this location, what we're looking for are all these pamphlets that promote the city of Del Rey, that promote the programming that goes on at Old School Square. Somebody to ask a question. You know, this becomes a place that's staffed with a member of Old School Square to help the visitors to the center and to Del Rey. Restrooms. 
okay? Yeah, I mean, it, we have a 10 minute time frame, but I mean, I think this is kind of important as the commission, yeah, well, okay. go ahead. I'll try to race through it. But um, in the public restrooms, again, these are 30 year old fixtures. We're changing all the fixtures out. You know, we aren't, all we're doing with the finishes in there is cleaning them up, a new paint job. But, you know, with these COVID times, it's all become, you know, touch free also. So we're dealing with electronic sensors on all the fixtures to make that a little more hygienic for persons. There's also not a ADA compliant restroom by today's Florida Accessibility Code in the building. So what we've done is the one bedroom, the one bathroom that you see up towards the top of the page there, that there becomes a toilet room that has full ADA compliance. And we also added a, a diaper changing station in there for those who need. Um, you know, th this is a room right now. There's two of these lounge spaces that are uh, along the south west corner of, of the building there. At one point, we tried to enlarge this space, which meant basically taking that wall that divides the two of them out and increasing the size of that. After we analyzed that a bit, we felt that there might be better ways to go ahead and solve the problem. I mean, that wall that's between them was actually the original exterior wall of the building when it was built in 1925. As we were doing some exploratory work there, we found that there were windows that were just closed up over the area. So, you know, it's like when you're dealing with a building that's almost 100 years old and you really don't find a piece of steel, you want to try to minimize how much you open up. So what we opted for, uh, so what we're doing in this space is there's some built-in, there was some built-in furniture there. Um, just trying to clean it up so that way at least the room becomes a little more versatile in terms of the use by not having things notched into it or um, cutting into it. And then, you know, with respect to the way things are moving with technology where arts classes are being done or have been done during COVID by way of the internet, you know, we've gone ahead and provided accommodation where these spaces can serve the needs that uh, are currently required. So as an alternate to that large space, what we did was we looked at the Ocean Breeze Room, which is on the southeast corner of the building there. And this space <clears throat> basically serves as the only banquet space for the building. So we still can accommodate about 75 persons in there. And what we've gone ahead and done is put this little service bar in there where it becomes a donor amenity during shows where if a patron wants to go and, you know, get out of the lobby space, because now that space gets used as that additional lobby area as well, where there's a bar in there and the location of it gives you the opportunity where that space can work for both indoor and outdoor performances because it's in the middle of it and basically accessible to either side where you can still control access into the building. So, um, you know, it's not a sit at bar. This is just, you know, a serving concession counter where you can go up to and, uh, you know, have a little bit of milling space around the outside. Uh, again, in here, the space had all these sconces that were put in back in the 90s, so we wound up taking them out and replaced all the lighting with more energy efficiency. Probably the biggest thing we're doing on this project is this commercial kitchen. I mean, right now, I wouldn't even say that this is a warming kitchen. It's more of like a little break room. It's a big break room. So what we feel like is that by going ahead and providing this commercial kitchen it gives the entire center more opportunity and not having to rely on outdoor vendors to come in to prepare it's in my way but sorry uh, you know just it, it gives them a little more opportunity and flexibility to go ahead and uh, 
you know, provide food service. But what it also does is it gives them the opportunity to expand on their programming. Now it opens up culinary arts classes that people can go into. You know, as Bill mentioned, you know, it becomes a training facility for uh, local restaurants uh, in terms of training for the, the industry there. So, you know, it's a full kitchen with all of the necessary appliances. So here's just, again, a couple photos from when, before we started of the lobby. So you can see the, the photo on the left, you know, that second floor balcony that's up there, you know, it basically just cuts anything off to view up to the second floor. The photo on the right is, you know, looking at the main lobby as you look towards the front door. Again, you can see those shutters in that window that really make this nothing more than circulation space, as I mentioned. Here's some photos, you know, progress that were taken recently on the, the status of the interior improvements. So this is that same lobby where we actually gained space on the second floor by pulling it out further to, this, to the existing structure. And now we have these transparent railings that as you come through, you're able to look into it. The photo on the right there, you can see the openness that we create as you're coming down that corridor where all of a sudden now there's lines of sight that take you around the corner and you don't have to get by the edge to see that. You can see, you know, work down along the two corridors, you know, or pretty well along there. In the ocean breeze room, you know, basically just waiting on finishes and uh, sanding stuff and getting all the millwork in there. The photo on the right is the progress at the uh, kitchen right now. Those are mechanical ducts that are just hanging there right now waiting to be supported up above. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is one image that we have where, you know, the photographs try to show where we're going with this thing. So that way you start to see the movement and you start to see the people move throughout this space and, you know, and re-energize it in the interiors. Thank you for your time. Thank you. To the uh, commission. You want to start? Um, I was invited to come and visit. By the way, I, a statement was made that all of the commissioners have uh, visited the site. Is that true? I, I haven't personally, but it was, you know, just I haven't. I mean, I, I was over there when it was the process was going to be going underway. I think it was prior to the, I want to say it was when we were there when we were doing the um, menorah. It was the last time I was there. Right, right. That was the last time I was there. So inside. Yeah, no, we were inside because we were up on the stage, but that was when yeah. we were basically mm -hmm. toured. But I haven't, I haven't toured it since it's had a lot of conversations, but not since yeah. the beautiful construction has yeah. started. I haven't, I haven't either. Okay, you toured. And I presume Commissioner Boston has been in and out. I was not. I aware. Have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was not aware of this project until I was invited to tour. I want to say the latter part of June, perhaps, before the 4th. Um, and I was, frankly, very surprised because they hadn't come to the commission or any organization that I'm aware of. And my understanding was that you adamantly did not do anything to city property that was not approved by city. And that's when I started asking questions. and. Here we are. Mm -hmm. um, the more I dig into it, the more I'm just astonished as to how we got here with, um, and apparently after what they've said tonight, there have been other uh, improvements to city property that the city has not been involved with. I'd like to defer to the city attorney to give us a little background as to exactly what's going on, because there are other concerns I have with uh, what's going on. I know Anthea can speak to it a little bit better. One of the, one of the improvements actually went through Historic Preservation Board. So even Which though was that, that I'm sorry? Which one was that, do you know? Anthea, do you the, know? 
the interior of the museum. Uh, and Thea's going to take over sorry, the microphone. I could respond. Oh, I'm Thank sorry, you. I didn't see you here. No I'm problem. So sorry. Um, so just to be clear, I'm Thea Gignotis, Development Services Director. Um, the Historic Preservation Board actually does not have purview over interiors. The Cornell Museum went to the Historic Preservation Board for review because they were changing the doors. Mm -hmm. And the doors were at exterior doors and the fittings and, and things like that. And so it would have, um, you know, even though it was just a set of doors and some minor alterations to the outside, it was the outside that changes it. We don't currently have um, regulations that oversee the inside of our historic buildings. And so that's why, as extensive as these renovations are, it did not require board approval. Just you know, from a building permit perspective. You're saying the same thing was the case in the Cornell? No, the Cornell required historic preservation. Well, only board. because it was the doors. Because you said. of the doors, yes. And so. Did it, you see the whole thing? And I, I'm sure I, I wasn't at the meeting, but, you know, usually they, they provide. It a came before the commission? As an appealable item. Mm -hmm. As an appealable. Okay. Mm -hmm. But somehow it came to somewhere. Yes. It was the historic, so then it Right, became, and the permit wouldn't have been released. Until, and we're doing doors here, too, yeah? Yes, I was going to ask not about exterior the doors. Not exterior doors. Interior. Everything that you see in front of you is... I thought there was a different Yeah, you said system. something about automatic doors. Does that not change the door? Just the openers. You have to come to the podium. The fixture. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, uh, it's, we've, we're changing the door closers and putting automatic um, operators on those doors. It's the Same hardware. doors, just the hardware. Like the gear that's up there and that doesn't trip a board of board review at that level okay so back to you so th that's the only other um, I know that there's been two improvements the one went before historic preservation board which presumably places the city on notice obviously because you're going through the process it comes before you as an appealable and so from our perspective the lease requirements were met because of the because of that process that's in our LDRs. I don't know what the other um, the other improvements were. I'm just not privy to that. Um, and then we have this one that's pending before you now. So my concern is, first of all, I've never seen anything that affected the city that did not have to come before our FP or a some kind of, I'm just thoroughly confused about how and why this project, this property, is excluded from our normal ways of doing business. Because if I were a contractor and something like this was happening on city property, I would have great concern that it did not go through our process of improvements. So this lease agreement is a little bit, it's a little bit different than the standard lease agreements and license agreements that we utilize. Um, I did a quick search and I, I couldn't find any other agreement where the issuance of a building permit would constitute consent. And there's reasons for that, right? I mean, um, to put that onus on a permit clerk is unfair and it's unreasonable. So it's a little surprising to see that here. That's not to say that, you know, the parties didn't agree and signed off on it. So that probably needs to be addressed in some way, shape or form this evening um, if in, you know, in order to move forward because it, sets the, it's, it actually sets the parties up for failure. It sets the city up for failure because of what we're dealing with now with you know, staff that's unable to determine who the actual owner is when you know, a tenant labels themselves as an owner. So, and it sets the tenant up for failure because they're commencing a project with the, you know, the mistaken belief that they actually have consent, valid consent from the city, and now they have to stop their project in the middle of it because they have to get the requisite consent. So that line in there, it, it needs to be removed. It needs to be amended. And I do have proposed language if the commission wants to hear it on ways to, um, to make sure that everybody has certainty and clarity because that's what we want out of this. We want them to succeed. We want this project to be successful and to, for them to you know, be um, making their own revenue so that they're not relying on the city or the CRA. That's what we want. But we don't want to have these situations where so much staff time is being spent on interpreting a contract that should be relatively simple. The public is the owner of these buildings. You five represent the public in the interest of the public. So while this is a long-term lease and they do take on obligations that would make somebody believe that they're the owner, Old School Square is not the owner of this property. And candidly, when you look at the renovations, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, but you should have given the opportunity to review this before they were commenced. 
because maybe the commission didn't want to change the stairwell. And that's beyond your control now because we're in the midst of construction. So, you know, Francis and staff and I, we had a very good conversation today to discuss the expectations of everybody. And listen, there's communication failures on both sides. You know, I'm not happy with how the city performed in this. I feel that a lot of it is due to the turnover and, you know, we can't really control that. However, you know, as a tenant, they have an obligation. Apparently they know all five of you, right? And in order, you know, just to say, hey, who's the city manager? Can you put me in touch with the city manager? That's not a hard ask and it's not something difficult to determine. So I, I think just based on the conversations today, I think everybody's on the same page as to what the requirements are. That being said, you know, there are portions of this lease that need to be addressed. There's a lot in here that's overbearing, complicated, difficult for staff to interpret and to be able to uh, execute the will and the wishes of the commission, and that needs to be addressed. So this is, this is almost like the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. because, frankly, there's just a lot in here, and there's a lot of requirements that Old School Square has to meet that, frankly, they're not meeting right now. And whether it's that they didn't have a point person in the city to guide them through the process, or they have their own turnover on their board, which you five don't control that, but there's a lot in here that needs to be addressed. And I know, Commissioner Johnson, you love workshops. This needs to have a workshop because I think okay. everybody needs to be on the same page as to what the goal is, what the big picture is, and how we're going to get there. And unfortunately, this lease doesn't get you there. This lease just is so overwhelming. It's very complicated, and it puts us in these types of situations where, frankly, you know, they have a very generous donor who's paying for this. You know, if you were to terminate this lease today or say no to these improvements, I mean, are the taxpayers going to be responsible for this? Because if you look at it, the building is in no position to be utilized in the state that it is now. And it, frankly, it has a stop work order. So these are all, you know, these are all conversations that really should have been had a year ago when, in the planning stages. Unfortunately, this is where we are. This is what we're dealing with. But at the end of the day, whatever the commission decides today, I don't think the conversation ends today. I think it has to move forward and I think bigger conversations need to be had. From my perspective, it starts with this lease. I'd like to add more to it. Um, several statements were made. Um, again, I agree with uh, the attorney, uh, Attorney Jellin. We didn't get an opportunity. Statements were made about a commercial kitchen. I don't think that's in the purview or the mission of what the old school square was all about. It was supposed to be entertainment, uh, some other things, but becoming a commercial kitchen wherein people are going to be trained how to do whatever people do is not a part of the mission. It was changed without our understanding or an agreement. Um, there are artifacts that no one's even mentioned where they are. I don't know if any of those items that were put in there or when they renovated it in 1990, was the city even watching what was going on then? Was any of the historic uh, items given to the Historic uh, Preservation uh, Society? I think that's the name of it. Um, historical Society? Yes, the Historical Society. Um, a lot of questions, a lot of goings on, and I frankly am a little saddened that the city dropped the ball in making sure that we were supervising and managing our property. And I think somewhere along the way, it gradually got to the point where nobody was watching, things happened, and we don't know what's going on there. We certainly put a lot of energy and concern about not changing uh, the pool reservations, the Pompey Park pool. Uh, the CRA couldn't even go in and say, oh, let's make the color and the towel so that we can get the bathroom done. But this huge renovation, everybody had either blinders or blind eye, and this is what we have now. And as the attorney said, we're in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. If we take it over, it's going to be the city, which I'm not adverse to doing. Uh, I think we have the money, as you just said, a million dollars. Uh, we can do anything we want to do. So it always comes back to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think in view of the fact that this is where it is now, the contract is onerous. I don't know who signed it and how it got passed. Uh, obviously, the present city 
attorney would not have agreed to it. Was it her? And so I think, I hate to say it, I don't want to continue until we've come to some resolution as to who's, who owns the property, what, the, what they can do, what we can do, um, who's responsible for what, and I don't know how fast we can get a workshop going. Um, I personally am not in favor of a commercial kitchen that uh, is going to be off the beaten path of what the objective of the uh, organization was, and especially to have it be only accessible to sponsors. Um, that's a little beyond the pale. The property belongs to the public. Everyone should have access to whatever is going on there. Um, unless it's rented and there's an affair that's for that rented. No, no, it's for ticket holders. If you go see a show and you he do said a meet sponsors. And well, if you go see a show and you buy a meet and greet ticket, they're going to have food or you're going to buy something or whatever. You just can't go and come in and expect a free He meal. said sponsors. That's not a ticket, ticket holder person. The expert person. knows more than me. Sounds a little elitist, that's all I'm saying. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I come before you with humility and with an understanding of your conflicts. I really do. Um, in no way, shape, or form was there ever an intention by any member of Old School Square to do anything out of order. Um, this is an unfortunate uh, event. I think a lot of it has to do with what Ms. Skellen has said could be a solution, and that is a really ongoing workshop. We, we plead for that. We agree with that. Um, we'd like to have the voices be part of what we're doing. But let me go back, and I don't want to say anything to start a rumble here, but I remember um, our mayor saying a culinary opportunity might be something really would be in addition to our site. And let me tell you, the, one of the other things that happens when we're making these kinds of decisions is we've become a culinary Atlantic Avenue, and we have lots of people who are asking for those kinds of classes. Now, we know we're an artistic venue. We're into the arts and so forth. But culinary arts is one of those opportunities. And so it, it really isn't true. I'm sorry, Ms. Farmer. It really isn't true that it is only to be used by a few. Our classes are open to all. There are scholarship classes. There are all kinds of classes. It is true that for uh, the ability to have a membership at a higher level so that we can earn more money for particular uh, exhibitions and so forth, we do have a select space. That is true. That is usually something that you find in the marketplace. And I, I think we could certainly make an opportunity where people can go more often, but it is a select opportunity and that's how we raise some of our monies. It's not an unusual thing. Back to... Um, our misunderstanding of the lease. The lease was created several years ago under uh, Mayor Glickstein, and it started out to try to promote an opportunity where we weren't coming back to the city for maintenance items. The word maintenance kind of got lost in the, in the language, and so what happened was it, it said that if we had a building permit, we could continue. I could not be more in agreement, and no one sitting here today who represents Old School Square could not be more in agreement that a, ca that a cap on what that means when we begin our work should be established. When Ms. Gellin mentioned to me today things about the lease and language that she didn't feel comfortable with, I said, I stand before you knowing that I would have the support of our board. Let's change those words. And I know she had language and opportunity today with our attorney. I know we've agreed to, to what they've put forward. There's more to be done. She diluted that there's more than those two words and more than those instances within the lease. That's all we really talked about today, but I certainly know that when we get into the workshop, we we will do more. Listen, folks, we are not about messing up your historic property. I spent many, many years at the state level in historic preservation. I would roll over dead before we lost our designation as a national registered property. What we are doing has a heartbeat and has a, we're bringing it into a new use. That's the important of historic properties, that they don't die by the wayside, they come to life because of new programs and opportunities. If we, as a board, 
when that lease was interpreted by those of us that were working, we would never have put our donor in any form shape to conflict with what her gift could be at this point in an embarrassing moment, making her feel that somehow we did something without the permission of the city. It's just not who we are. We acknowledge the mistake. We know that there were some things that perhaps happened among both situations. We've had, we've had COVID and a lot of other things we've gone through. If we look at the bad things that happened at Old School Square, I sort of want to flip it a little bit and look at the good things that have happened at Old School Square. We created a wonderful event with Jimmy Buffett and we gave the city in conjunction with a lot of people, the opportunity to be a, a, a landmark opportunity. You couldn't buy that kind of public relations. They didn't talk about Jimmy Buffett being at Old School Square. They talked about Jimmy Buffett being in the city of Delray Beach. And we're, we want to move forward. The COVID was hurt us all. We're not using it as an excuse, it's just a fact. Mea culpa, mea culpa for anything we did, for anything we interpreted in, inappropriately, for anything we said we should have done and shouldn't have done. It was not through malice, it was through ignorance. Maybe it's not a, a, the ability to read the lease correctly. Maybe that really was the intent of the lease in the beginning. It doesn't matter. We stand here before you saying we are committed to this project. We want a workshop. There isn't one of you I won't talk to. There isn't one of you any of us won't talk to. This is the lifeblood of our community. This isn't something that what I ask you to contribute to is, is a fluff. This is a line item for this community that has been an earmark for who we are, where we go. When, when the Atlantic Avenue school kids walked down after the horrible, horrible tragedy in Fort Lauderdale, they came and they rested on our grounds and they cried. When Corey Jones was killed, his band leaders came to our pavilion and they cried. We're more than just a building. We're more than just an arts organization. We're more than just a board who wants to def to confuse people. We may be confused. I frankly, I'm getting old enough to be more confused than not. But I can tell you standing right here, I'm not dishonest. No one I know in this project is dishonest. We like and respect each and every one of you. We respect Shirley's opinions. I will bend over backwards to try to please you and each and every one of you as our board will. But I can tell you, we need to move on. We have a tremendous opportunity September 22nd to open up the site with this, with this wonderful addition. We're going to have an open house. The programs are already made. We've got the people coming into the theater to perform. We're ready to go, so let us. You will be proud of us, and we will sit in every workshop on every topic, and we will listen, because what we want to do is be the citizens you deserve for a project we all believe in. Thank you. Commissioner? That's Mary. I, mean. um, I thank you very much for, thank for you, your Warren. comments. Uh, I'm just at a point where there's just been so much that I've found out and the little I've been able to uncover. Uh, we're about to go into the CRA A Guide. And I, having spoken with the uh, executive director, am just wondering where it's going to go. And it's a little unfortunate that we didn't have that meeting before this one because we may not be having that meeting. So this meeting. So um, I'm willing to do whatever. I am not, however, willing to continue with the um, with the work because I'm not just so sure that we're going to be able to do that. Um, Commissioner Boylston, are you with us? Did you want to speak? I am. Um, I think there's a much long, larger conversation to be had. Um, I believe most likely Ms. Ms. Johnson is interested in having that conversation um, and maybe in a workshop or even as with our CRA hats on. Um, but today's agenda item is very specific in scope and to the renovation. Uh, meeting with staff and especially with Ms. Jellen, there are obviously a few issues with the lease I want to, uh, I want to make sure that we address. Um, no doubt that the internal maintenance and renovations are left to the tenant, except that I don't think when written into the lease that we thought multi-million dollar renovations were going to be done. Um, I think probably more in line with 
carpet replacement or painting of walls, et cetera. So um, I think we need to take a step back. We need to adjust any of the issues that Ms. Jellen has with this lease agreement so that we don't run into issues like this again. And we need to put on our agenda after the A-Guide presentations and after the A-Guide um, conversation has been had at the CRA level, I think the city commission needs to get together and discuss our expectations of any organization that has the responsibility of running our cultural arts organization um, at, at Old School Square's campus. Um, so that's what I would like to see happen. I, I, I don't want work to stop. The work can continue. Um, and uh, But I think there's a lot bigger conversation that needs to be had in regards to this uh, this arrangement or this partnership. Thank you. We agree. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'll go. Okay. Thank you. Right um, first, Ms. Bork, members of the board, thank you for volunteering your time, your generosity. Uh, the donation is, is simply amazing. Um, the work, it's beautiful. What you guys have accomplished coming out of a pandemic. Uh, I was at Jimmy Buffett one of the nights. Uh, what Ms. Bork states is they didn't say Jimmy Buffett at Old School Square. They said Jimmy Buffett at Delray Beach. They said it in Billboard Magazine nationally. They played the concerts, two of the concerts on Sirius XM multiple times. Um, it was an amazing opportunity for the entire city. Uh, that being said, you know, seeing since my time up here since 2009, I've seen some things that, in my opinion, need to be improved. And uh, you know, uh, had conversations uh, about this, uh, Mr. Branding, this morning, and in particular, I spoke to Joe Gilly. And uh, Joe Gilly knew Old School Square better than anyone, and he knew how to communicate what you all do as, as a board, as a nonprofit. And I remember he had a chart. Every year he came in with this chart with the number of nonprofits that use Old School Square at a limited or no charge. Right. Still continues. And what is that? 50, 75, 100 organizations? I don't know. But the communication has kind of stopped in that regard. Oh, and the, the, only, the other issue that isn't here anymore, unfortunately, <laughs> Mr. Barzinski. Oh, Whenever yes. there was a, something that went on between Old School Square, they called Mr. Barzinski. Within 24 hours, it was fixed. Yes. We don't have that like we used to. Mr. Yes. B that not only for Old School Square, but for many of the things in the city. Yes. Uh, and I think that part of the communication uh, is there. Uh, not there, unfortunately. Um, it's been preferenced by some of my colleagues and more importantly, the city attorney. There's no reason to have a 46-page lease. There's none. I, 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 I just, I don't think this is a complicated arrangement. No. Um, the fact is, uh, city owns the property. Whoever filled out the building permit messed up, and it, it, that's it. It was a mistake, in my view. Uh, but to me, that's not cause to stop the beautiful construction. And the, the gentleman, uh, the architect, thank you very much. Just a, a beautiful plan, beautiful presentation as well. Um, but what I did hear coming out of this, and I, I've spoken to our city attorney many times, uh, is the communication and the tour and everything that occurred today is extremely positive. I think all sides have stated today, improvements need to be done. Yes. Guess what? Take a, a little bump in the road and, and improve things going forward. Uh, I you. think we all can agree on that. I think uh, changes need to be made uh, to the agreement and update uh, with specificity what the expectations are. Uh, I know the city commission, uh, we expect to know what's going on. This isn't changing a door. This is making major, major improvements and renovations. And, and a, a side note, the museum looks gorgeous too. Uh, whoever did that, it's, it's stunning. It's, it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to it's stunning. stunning. That is unbelievable. And I think uh, th that's a message that's not put out there enough because you know my office is across the street, so I know where it's there. But it's just because of this, the layout, the setup, people don't know what a gem that is. That's just stunning. So to me, I mean, obviously, I'm going to uh, go ahead and thank you and, and move to approve, uh, at, after my colleague speaks, uh, my colleagues speak, I should say, 
Uh, but, you know, let, let's learn from what has occurred. We've had conversations. We Concerns have been expressed. I think you've taken them. And, uh, you know, I say this with appreciation and, and constructive criticism. Uh, we have a jewel that we are lucky to have. So let's, let's improve on the situation and, and go forward. And I thank all of those that have worked hard and diligently. And, and more importantly, those that volunteer their time. You're not getting paid to go to these board meetings or working and whatever. You volunteer your time, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Vice Mayor. Um, Commissioner. Okay. Um, could you just, uh, for the, there's, there are people here, there are people listening, and there was a lot of conversation about this that was kind of cryptic last week and could have left people saying what the heck is going on. So I think for the general public, the residents, we should just clarify what's happening here a little bit more in depth. Um, when you're talking about an, an application that was signed, someone signed an application. You'll be a permit. Pardon me? You'll a be permit, permit, correct. Could, would you like to explain that to the public? I'm not sure. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, so I signed the application, and in the application, there's a uniform application in Palm Beach County uh, that, that Delray's is almost the same as. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, there's a space on it to to indicate fee simple property owner if not owner because the owner is the the lessee and and my office, we, I left that blank by mistake um, and and then there's there's a place for the owner to sign and the and the contractor to sign and I signed as contractor and I asked uh, Old School Square COO to sign as the owner because that's just the course of conduct that I've always followed. The, the, the county's form says, I think, owner or agent, something like that. And I didn't realize until it was called to my attention, the city's form says property owner. So, so that's that issue. You signed as the contractor and the well, who Olsen signed Square, as the owner? The COO of Olsen Square. Uh, that was picked up and caught during permit processing because the permit is issued correctly in the name of of the city of Delray Beach as lessor and Old School Square as lessee. Thank you. So. Um, and then um, the, so in terms of why this project didn't go out to bid, do you want to explain that to the public? Can do that. Sure. Mark, 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 do you mind? Yeah. Hello, my name is Margaret Bloom. Hi, Margaret. Um, I'm the donor for this project, as well as the donor for the museum project. And uh, you're asking me why this project did not go out to bid for general contractor. I think Ms. Johnson had mentioned that the project didn't go out to bid, so I think okay. it would be nice to explain that. Okay, and the reason why that happened is that I've known Bill, and his I know he was very involved with the museum project, although he was not the general contractor on that project. But as a stipulation of this donation, I wanted him to be the contractor for this, for the uh, the project. So that's why. Can someone explain to Ms. Bloom why that is not acceptable? Or is it? Go anywhere. Or is it? And and there's one more there's one more thing that I think maybe Ms. Connect Casal, uh, because we had a conversation about this, also whether we appropriately or inappropriately uh, misjudged the, the, the extension of the project, in our, in our minds, we were still falling within the fact that the uh, agreement had been signed by the city, the permit, and that we, were, we had followed what was expected. However, there's another reason why it's not required for it to go out to, uh, or an RFP, and that's because the interiors are being given in a historical property by a donor who's making a defined gift. Defined gifts in the marketplace are, are all over the place. People make gifts because they want a certain name, a certain, and that particular entity, when, you, when you're in the not-for-profit world and your job is to go out and make sure that you are getting donors to become involved in your projects. You don't give away 
a, the sense of anything that, that you would not give away simply because of money. You don't put a big billboard up and put a person's name. But within the context of the gift, you work really closely with the donor to make sure that they're getting what they want. It's all still within the acceptable guidelines of what we want, but that is how and why you're not required to go out because they can make and have the right to make certain requests in projects. Now, if, if this had been the exterior of the building, it's clear that this donation, for instance, the Cornells back in the day when they named the Cornell Museum, we came before the city and we said we have a donor who wants to name the building. We also had a, a list of donor opportunities that we provided the city with how we might name the museum, how we might name the field house, the different, how we might name the pavilion. Those are properties that belong clearly to the city, but we were given permission to go out and raise money to name them and to do whatever was required within the agreements so that we would have a, ha a happy and satisfied donor, a happy and satisfied community, and funds we needed to provide the entertainment and the, the renovations that we required. So it's not an unusual situation, it really isn't, and I hope I didn't overextend your question, but I, it, it's, there's a, there are a few innuendos in this. So if I could add to that. Sure. Uh, you know, this was a donation to a to a 501c3 nonprofit with with a designated use, and and that's something that cities don't often get. Uh, as a as a board member, uh, we sign a uh, um, not, con thank you conflict of interest uh, policy uh, in that and and so ordinarily you know, board members can't start making money off of uh, the entity which they're volunteering. Uh, in, there is a process to, to go through for, for a conflict of interest, and this is one of those cases. Uh, it, the, the issue was brought before our board. I was asked to be excused from the meeting. It was discussed, and the board voted unanimously to allow the conflict because that was the, the wishes of the donor. Uh, and then when the construction contract came, once again, it came before our board, and our board uh, approved the contract. So I, I guess the reason why um, this commission is struggling is because under our ethics rules, not, none of you could do something like that. Yeah. So if a project came before you and you were the business owner, it, it, you know, it, just, it doesn't, uh, I'm just going to be candid, it doesn't pass the smell test, right? You know, I understand that a board member can step off the dais, and, but there's just certain things that just have a certain sense of an appearance of impropriety that should be looked at probably a little bit more closely, and I think that's why um, why we're struggling. I think that one thing that you can do is perhaps um, our minutes taken at your meetings. Sure. Yes. Right yeah. So maybe if the commission were provided with those minutes to find out exactly what was stated to the board and how the process uh, played out, I think that might give the commission some satisfaction that the board was properly apprised as to what the issues were that the board properly considered the issues and that the vote was proper. So I would probably recommend um, the old school square board forwarding those documents. You can forward them to me and I'm happy to distribute them to the commission so that we can ensure um, that, the, you know, the, that the process and the way that we got to where we are today was transparent and right. was complete and, you know, was done according to whatever ethics standards you as commissioners would have. I think, I think that might give you some more assurances. Right. M Mr. Um, Frankel mentioned Bob Brzezinski, and that, that was a key connection that made us so successful and, and made moments like this not so common, in fact, rarer. And I'm happy to say that we were notified today that Missy Barletto is going to be the city liaison. Hallelujah. We're so pleased. This is something that, that this added with uh, our <laughs> workshops is tremendous and I think that you will find less and less moments of concern because that opportunity for her to be part of what we're doing and, and be available is just amazing and thank you for that. I think that will alleviate so much of what has gone on in the last several years and, and God, I won't say God rest Bob Brzezinski's soul because he's still very much alive. <laughs> I but say. I would say that he was such an he was such an example of how we can be cohesive, and I think that's really, really important. Thank you, thank you for that. Right. And let's maybe just touch on 
one more thing. And I'm just reiterating conversations I've had so people understand what's actually going on. You said there was uh, another, a couple other compliance issues. Are those the auditing issues? Um, so in reviewing the lease, and I, I know Missy can probably speak to it a little bit better than I, but there were um, some concerns that, um, you know, I, I was made aware of the A, help me. A guide. A guide. A guide. Um, according to the CRA, I believe it was a uh, their agenda memo. It didn't appear that that was in compliance. Um, as you know, um, School Square does receive funding from the CRA. Right. So as uh, actually as part of this lease, they have to maintain compliance with whatever funding agreements they have with other entities. Otherwise, that could be uh, considered a, um, a breach of the lease. Um, I don't know, um, staff didn't have any um, documentation of any payment bonds for these construction improvements. And so the lease does require um, that a bond be um, issued, obviously naming the city, um, so that in the event that something happens during this period of construction, that obviously the city's interests are protected. Uh, we can afford that too. Okay. So, you know. A lot of these things, you know, again, it's it's that communication, you know, yes. um, it's it's just non-existent, and hopefully by having Missy as the liaison, you know, Missy and I have discussed the lease. We're aware everybody's on the city side is aware of the terms and conditions, and hopefully um, there will be compliance. There are reporting requirements that I I, I understand you're working on, but they're very late um, in the form of years. So that we need to yes. to you know just. Can we discuss how we're going to resolve that, um, like, day so that we can, you know, the people can feel comfortable at the conclusion of this meeting, and maybe we won't actually need a workshop. Um, but the I think the, we need a workshop, Commissioner. We really we do. Can, we can we can have Missy or staff just provide a report back in six, 30, 60 days as to where they are with the requirements. I'm happy to sit with Missy and go through all the terms of the lease that we do not believe are in compliance because we do not have proof of their compliance. And you know we can set a deadline of 60 days where we can report back to the commission. And at that point, you can decide you know, how to move forward. You know, I, I know we have a lot of workshops and I know that your time is precious, but I think with this lease, it's just very hard to negotiate something um, without your input. And so collective input. And so I do think that the workshop is necessary only because you know, even even the annual site plan permit, I remember years ago when Mr. Lozier was here, that was an impossible task to, to you know, undertake, figure out, help staff interpret. And so it's things like that, that we need the commission's guidance. If those are things you want to delegate to the city manager's office, to Missy, the liaison, that's fine. But the way that the lease reads, you know, it's just very onerous undertakings that I, I understand the reason for it. I get it. Um, but, you know, it's different when you put stuff on paper and then when you have to administrate it. Right, the administration is what the problem it's is. It's two issues, though. It's the issue is the lease going forward, and the issue is rectifying the current situation. And so in, in separating them out, how do they get in compliance? What's going on? That's the question that needs to be, you know, Answered, and we talked about what the compliance issues are. If you want to reiterate them, so people know, <laughs> and then everybody's clear on exactly what's going on. In the main compliance issue right now is is obtaining your consent. That's that's the main one, you know, only because it's imminent. The reporting requirements are a concern, you know, um, from the city's perspective. We we want people to be transparent. We want people who are utilizing our public buildings to be transparent. And the public has a right to know who is in these buildings and who is inhabiting these buildings. So, from that standpoint, you know those things. Y the lease, you know, we can place them on notice that they have 30 days to come into compliance with these things and let them know that, um, you know, these are missing. <laughs> um, but obviously, that's that's with your direction. Is that doable for you? Can you come into compliance in 30 days? So the, there's a, a list of reported. Hey, hold on just a minute. We have a question. Go ahead. Uh, what constitutes Turning compliance? Turning in the financials uh, that, that Attorney Jellin is referring to that are us due. So kind of I compliance? believe it's, it's Article 6, I believe, of the lease has the reporting requirements. 
and it's it's a laundry list. I mean, it, I, I don't know if 30 days is sufficient because, like I indicated, some of these things go back more than a year. So there's at least, it goes all the way to H. And so, you know, they have different timelines associated with them, you know, from the effective date of the lease, 180 days, 30 days, 60 days. There's a lot in here. And, you know, I, I Missy is working on, you know, obtaining these documents, but as it stands right now, I don't believe that the city's in receipt of them. Okay, could we ask, offer them some assistance to move forward? They want to be the city's partner. The city wants success. What if we allow our auditor to go That's assist them getting in compliance? I was going to make a suggestion that we have a forensic yeah. investigation, oh. auditor, whatever you want to term it. And I think it's going to take more than 30 days. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Sure. So I'm just, again, I'm, I'm just looking at the agenda item tonight, re review and consider improvements to Old School Square proposed by the Old School Square Center for the Arts, Inc. Um, and I'm going to stay focused on, you know, on that topic. I do think there's some concerns in regards to um, some of the, some of the shortfallings in regards to documentation and audits and financials. I think that's going to be a concern for the CRA. And then when it is a concern for the CRA, I think it's going to be a concern for the city commission. But I, I really think that's another conversation. And when the, the conversation tonight is in regards to this, um, this renovation, these improvements, um, and I, I apologize, I'm not there, but Ms. Bloom, thank you for this investment into, into our, uh, our city's historic buildings. And, uh, and I want to make sure that this considers to move, continues to move forward. But again, there is a larger conversation that um, I think we'll be, we, we will be having, um, and that will, that will come at the right time um, with the scheduled CRA A guide presentations right around the corner. Right, but um, you, Commissioner. if I may just say that I think what Attorney Jellin is saying is that's a component of the lease that's problematic. Well, the component of the lease is the component in regards to their funding. As of right now, their their A guide funding is is still in place. But if that funding wasn't in place, then uh, that would be for the city commission to discuss the lease and whether or not our tenant has the original funding agent in place from when they signed the lease. Right. As of right now, that hasn't changed. We want Let to me help ask them. the question, Commissioner Boylston. Who's the lease with, the CRA or the City Commission? City Commission. Okay. Thank you. Just, uh, if you can just let Missy speak to the reports. Yeah, um, I think that would she be can great. Provide Thank you. A little you. bit more clarity. I'm sorry, say that again. <laughs> C. Barletto can speak to sure. the reports. Oh, I didn't see Barletto, you Public Works Director. I didn't see you clapping back there when everybody else was. <laughs> I know. Saying. Yeah, I was hiding. <laughs> no, I just wanted to, to say that. Um, we asked for the reports that were delinquent. I think the biggest problem was that they were not sure who they needed to submit those reports to. And I have already received the, the reports that are required in the lease. They do need some level of review, but I have okay. received them. So they are, they are attempting to be completely in compliance with their lease agreement. How, how uh, delinquent are they, the reports? That, that's an excellent question. The, the lease doesn't speak to exact dates that they're due. So, I, they, I mean, I these will be monthly. things that we need to workshop and move forward I on. I thought it said monthly. Am I wrong? I thought I read monthly. There's different, there's different reporting different. deadlines depending on the report. Um, so it would just, it would be dependent on the type of the report, but some are 30 days, some are more than that. So, so my, my thoughts are that we, these reports are probably going to be outside of the scope of my abilities, probably some most of the commission. I don't know um, who, who has the, you know, the background. But we do have, like we said, a, um, you know, uh, an auditor that could look at this for us and give us her opinion to us because that's somebody that we employ. And I think that that might be the way to do this so that, you know, you have the reports. You can hand them over to um, Julia. Julia can go through them. And she can look at the, you know, the the audits and everything together, and give us her opinion as to what's going on here. I think that that would be the best, you know, way to do this. From my perspective, it would make me feel comfortable. 
I mean, we're talking about, um, and then and then I do believe that we have to do something with that um, lease. That's obvious. Um, and I think that we should hold off on, I mean, that's a conversation that's going to be a little bit deeper. I don't know that you're going to have everything handled right here in the lease as to what needs to happen, but you probably know in, in a certain direction where, where it needs to go. Um, so, you know, that, that would be something I think that you should probably take on and, and move forward with. I'm sorry. Um, but <laughs> Um, that's that would be my suggestion. We had very preliminary discussions about the concerns this today, and mm -hmm. um, we know what sections need to be addressed. Obviously, if the commission has additional suggestions, we can always bring that to you. So, uh, just to be clear, um, because um, Dr. David Ian is not present this evening, right? Um, so she she her job is not to assist Old School Square. No. Her job is to oh, review true. the documents, Correct. look at inefficiencies, and report back to you, and come up with, you know, compliance and things like that. Correct. So I just want to be clear because she, you know, her positions with the city, not, not with a nonprofit, and assisting them in preparing documents. Mm -hmm. No, like that. no, that's not what we're asking. We're asking to make sure that whatever is being, you know, turned over, meets the smell test. Because I wouldn't know, the truth. I mean, I, I just wouldn't. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not that in depth in understanding how these um, organizations work, and I don't know that anybody up here is. But can we agree that the um, veering off from what the original intent of the agreement in allowing them to have this property, lease this property, may not have included the commercial kitchen? Well, I mean, you know, that's an interesting question, and I didn't. I did. I um, I have to say that I did speak with um, uh, Miss Bork and others in the organization, and and it was months and I mean, well, years ago, I guess it would be. Um, wouldn't it be great to have a culinary aspect, a culinary arts aspect to part of the old school square um, campus? And as a matter of fact, uh, Marga Marjorie, or Mar Marjorie Waldo. Um, and I had a conversation, and this was back way, way back because of that great, um, you know, showcase, uh, you know, uh, front frontage that she has along second. I thought, wow, wouldn't that be just an amazing place where you have chefs coming in and people are gathering and watching through the windows? And, you know, it didn't end up being that. It ended up going in the uh, in the opposite direction. But in talking with a lot of the restaurateurs down in the on the avenue, they're, they have a gap in getting experienced um, chefs in, from, from the line cooks to um, sous chefs to uh, prep people. They don't have that ability to be able to get them, so they're having a real hard time attracting. We, are such a, we have such a great opportunity to possibly take a chef from one of the, you know, this is what we were talking about. It was a long time ago, but a chef from one of the the restaurants that's really versed and and giving a class on how to do prep or how to slice and dice or whatever, in in order to be able to help somebody start in that in that line of business because truthfully they can use these these kitchen workers and it pays good money. And are you aware that the um, school board is going to do that on? Village Academy's campus was not. No, I wasn't. But um, again, I, it doesn't. And that's only been within the last two or three years. Right. So, I was so. going to say it doesn't necessarily negate one. Doesn't negate another. I mean, it could be a, could a both. combination effect, and they might be looking at um, doing certifications. We could catering maybe same. in the kitchen. They may have yeah. caterers coming for events. It's but you know I, I, doesn't seem on the same line. I was going to say kitchen. on the, on the yeah. same line. I, I just want you to know that I noticed on the permit that there was nothing said about the kitchen either. So I wasn't even aware that oh, that was it, being. It's gutted. on the plumbers. Okay, I didn't read that. I, I read that original. That's not part original of the original one. permit. Yeah, and so I read that, and I was like, I didn't see it, so I didn't even know it was happening until yeah, I saw so. the pictures. Anyway, the lease does speak to educational activities, and yeah. I think yeah. that would qualify as an educational activity. Um, so I guess the three things that you need to consider, some of them we've already discussed. Um, so I guess we would need a motion um, to provide the consent for the improvements. Um, I would probably advise that perhaps that building application should probably be revised to mm -hmm. reflect the proper owner and the proper signature, which would be the mayor's signature, or you can delegate that to the city manager if you felt it was appropriate. And I guess, um, based on some of the conversation that occurred this evening, that the actual extent of the improvements should be um, adequately um, portrayed in that application. So, so moved. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Real simple. You asked for three things. I was just, oh, well, that was the first second. thing. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so that wasn't a real motion? No, it was. <laughs> she's not, comf she's not. Asked for three things. We got something else. The lease amendment, so you want me to start working on that. I'll get with Ms. Bork and her and her team, and we can start working on the concerns that we have. And then um, the bond, you're going to forward that paperwork to the city tomorrow. Um, did you want to get the copy of those minutes, or are you satisfied with the representation sure, I think it would that be, remains? Today? I think it would be good just for backup, and I think also the um, uh, having Julia, reaching out to Julia, and having that as being part of the condition that basically we have somebody that would look through the documentation that's being provided on the financials on our behalf. And with um, Dr. David Ian, um, what kind of a timeline are you looking for on that? If I mean, she has she, the paperwork? Is she, is she booked, I mean, is she really busy, do you know, or has she actually got some time? She was completing um, something with one of the departments, and I think it was almost complete. I can yeah. get with her, and we can do 60 as days as soon as she's available, she... because it sounds like the documentation's available. Right. <laughs> so 60 to 90 days, you would like a report back? I would say... Within 30 to 60, 30 to I don't 60. think that we need to be 90 days out. I don't want to be the one creating deadlines for people, so that's fine. So 30 to 60 days, um, and you're directing Dr. David Ian to um, review the re reports that were seen. And if she's, for some reason, not available, then you can get back with us individually yeah. and try and figure out what would be an alternative. Perfect. That's okay. Does that work for you? That works for me. I just would like to maybe state uh, two or three other things. Um, I'd like to correct you on uh, naming rights. We no longer do that. We are adamant. We do not name buildings in this city. Do we have that in the agreement? You know, in this agreement, I don't recall seeing anything. No, no, no. I'm not saying that that she's saying this. I'm just I correcting Ms. Bork sure about that. that. In the agreement. Oh, definitely, it's okay. not. I don't believe I saw that. Um, it used to be, but we got away from that. Okay. I think. Right. Something I, I I'm not familiar. Well, so remember I, we the, we had an offer of 150 thousand to name the outdoor a stage, 150 thousand naming rights. So I just don't know what's in their agreement and what's not. So I, I don't want to say anything. We until we also checks it out. But anyway, I'm also okay. not aware of that. I'd love to have a copy of that because that sort of adjusts some of the things we believe we have the the opportunity to do. Be, so that's that's where, that's that's I'm not aware of that. I'm not yes. saying it's not true. I just we're not aware of that. Uh, These are the things that sometimes we do miss. We have a as adamant according to Mayor Glickstein, you do not name things after anyone. So I think the Cornell Museum. Oh, gosh, I thought he wanted me to name the field house after him. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to, he'll have to come before Where us. Where is he in his defense? <laughs> All right, what else? I would uh, ch uh, quote him chapter and verse about that. <laughs> um, there were some complaints that came to me. I didn't bring them to you. That um, there was there were residents who wanted to attend the Buffett concert and were not as fortunate as Commissioner uh, Adam uh, Frankel, rather, and uh, they were very, very disheartened because they felt after four performances that at least one of them should have been. Uh, we, to, to answer this, and I'd love to, surely this is, um, you, you know we had a, a firm. We did this in about five weeks, and we had a firm that took over the uh, ticket sales. And I'm sure you read some of the communications about some tickets were going for $10,000. We were way, uh, at that point, early out of the gate, we were, we were not able to even understand how that happened so quickly. We learned a lot. In, in the future, we understand that there will be a select number of tickets that are set aside for, for residents. I mean, we learned a lot. It was a learning experience. We, uh, who, you know, Jimmy Buffett used to get, you know, whatever it is, 230,000 people, two million, I mean, two million dollars, but 230,000 people. We had the opportunity for like 1,200 for the four visits. Who could have imagined that we were going to get people in England trying to get the tickets? And it, please, we apologize. We apologize to the public. The public. This, <laughs> we, we don't want this to happen again. I know Holland would address it as well. But, um, I can't say it'll never happen ever again that there will be a, someone who comes to the gate and says they weren't allowed well, we to We can ticket. put it in a contract. Yeah, but whatever, we learned a lot. We all learned a lot. Our police learned a lot. Our fire people, everybody learned a lot. 
And so much so that I guess if you wanted a report of what we learned, we, we still are behind in that as well. <laughs> but I can promise you that we did not want that to happen. And we weren't totally in control of it. And we will work very hard to make sure our citizenry are number one in, in any opportunity that we're providing. So I appreciate that comment. And I understand where it's coming from. And when, we, <coughs> when we have our one-on-one, -on -one, I'll give you some additional input that I've gotten from the residents. Because sure. a lot of people have come to me about a lot of different things. And, and, and that, uh, that's the way we get better. That's the way we get better. No question about it. Ma'am. And that is it. OK, and so really we quick. had a really quick thing. The <laughs> rights is actually in the lease. And it's subject to the city's reasonable consent. What is that? I'm sorry. The naming rights enter into a naming rights consent. agreement for the premises subject to the lessor, which is the city, is reasonable consent. The terms of any such agreement may not exceed the terms of this lease. So while they're the tenant, subject to your approval, they can have naming rights. But once the lease terminates, then those would go away. The, ter the, the naming rights the naming would go rights away? Go away? Mm -hmm. wow. the terms so of if someone agreement. puts their name on a building, be because we agree, then but should they not we'll manage? No, no, no. My name won't. No, no. <laughs> I can guarantee you. Um, so you the name would chisel off. What? The name would be chiseled off. Oh, I guess I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me let me make you feel a little bit more comfortable about that process. Back in the day when the Cornell Museum was named, a, a gift that a donor made was considered to be ad infinitum. Your name went on a building and no one took it out. That is long past. Now a gift for a stadium of football or a name on a college campus or whatever, it has a limit. Mm -hmm. For instance, it may be a million dollars for a 10-year gift. And after that, it's back in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Things have changed dramatically in that world. Mm -hmm. And we would be foolish not to adv advise ourselves mm -hmm. and you as well as to what's in the marketplace at that point. But we couldn't do that either. Yeah. Motion to approve seven inch. With? With the conditions uh, <laughs> given by our great city attorney. There you go. Second. All right. Yeah. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? He's he fell asleep. Yes. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Thank you for taking very the time. Very good. Thank you, guys. Well. And uh, yeah. thank you very much. Thank, thank you very guys. much. See you, you Thursday. It. Absolutely. Thank you. thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you, Ms. Bloom. And we can hardly wait for the <laughs> workshop. You got it. Oh, Okay, so moving on to our final item, which is the discussion and consideration of um, city manager's performance and employment agreement. Dot is going to be coming up for that. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Um, this agenda, this Dot Bass Human Resources, this agenda item requests the Commission discuss and consider the salary and the benefits provided by the interim city manager's employment agreement which was effective on June 24th of 2020. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Ms. Alvarez was appointed on June 24, 2020 as the interim. Obviously, it's been in excess of one year. Pursuant to our city personnel policies, every employee is eligible for consideration of a merit increase upon, um, on a yearly basis, and that would be her anniversary date. Um, she, um, in lieu of a merit increase, she would request um, that sick time, sick leave be given to her, to her accrual banks. Um, I know I've spoken with each of you individually about this. And, um, you know, if there are concerns with um, giving her the sick leave, you know, you don't want to give somebody a golden parachute, things like that, we could put time limits on it. She had no objection to putting an 18-month cap use it or lose it, it's not the subject to any type of a payout. It would strictly be used for her leave. Um, so it's, it's not something that's in our personnel policies. But as you know, um, you have three direct reports that we technically are kind of outside of those policies um, because we report directly to you. So it's not something that would necessarily set a precedent if that's what you're concerned about. Um, so that's her request. So let me ask a question. Um, the request is for 240 hours, is that correct? So it'd be 30 days, six weeks, which amounts to 240 hours, yes. Six weeks? Six weeks. And, and what does that equate to in dollars? 
I, 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 let me just stop here for a second. First of all, let me just ask this. The agreement that we have with her automatically gives her the 5% increase, or is it something that is merit pay increase um, just according to, because we didn't do any kind of like a, an evaluation, yeah? That's correct. Right. Yes. Pardon me? You did not. Okay, and so in lieu of that evaluation, she's asking for no merit pay increase, but rather six weeks of sick leave. Exactly. I was looking okay. for the math. I, I'm trying I can to figure it out for you. Can we give her the um, six, sick leave that would equate to the merit increase? But we haven't given her the merit increase, so we don't even know what that is. Well, we if haven't we given were to her say we gave her the top, it would be 5%, mm -hmm. correct? Okay, so that equates to about uh, 13 days? It would be around 13 days. So why don't we give her the 13 days, which would be equivalent we, to the merit Can increase. we stop before we go any further? Sure. Uh, we need to decide if we're going to give an evaluation. She's it's, it's not an automatic that no, you're no, going to get. No, no, I just said that, and the mayor said, why don't we just give her that? No, she, I think she was asking not to do the evaluation potentially. Is that what I'm thinking? And she then, wasn't asking for that. Um, I think it's only right that if we're going to discuss anything about either a merit or in lieu of, et cetera, that we give an evaluation. Um, I'm, I'm very disturbed that... I have never given, I think I gave one to Mark, I'm not sure. I've never given an evaluation to our city managers, our interim city managers. Never? Mr. Mister De Jesus never got an evaluation, but he got lots of increases. So are you proposing then we'd go do our evaluation? He should always give amount. an evaluation. How are you going to know what... Merit, not merit, right? Exchange. If we don't do it, okay. I'm not. I I'm I'm totally amenable to that. But I guess what I'm just thinking is, woman stepped up when we asked her to evaluation. She gets no, no, no. I know, but the evaluation is one thing, and the merit increase is another. If you're connecting, if you're going to say the evaluation determines the merit increase, and we're only giving her that much. No, if no, you already no. predetermined it, you the can amount always, of time you'll give her. You can always give a an employee that's a direct report, any right, and she's asking merit to, increase you want to, right. it's not necessarily tied to the evaluation, but if someone's not performing okay, and you don't so, want to necessarily... Um, she's looking for, if you were to give her a 5% increase, it's $9,475, 103 hours or 13 days. She's asking for substantially more for reasons we all know. The question is. I'm sorry, I don't. I, okay, I can't. Well, we don't want to. Do it's don't know. Per, for personal reasons, mm -hmm. and so the question is, do we want to give her the amount that would equate to a five percent increase, even if you maybe say my evaluation would put her at a lower percentage because she did step up, she she did the job for us here, and 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 because it's a it's a it's. She's asking for considerably more than that, and maybe it's a compromise because she stepped up and did the job for us temporarily. That we look at the five percent. I'm still amenable to doing the the evaluation, and and I think I mean, we should record. be honest. Yeah. For the record, I I just think that I agree with that. Those things are important. Uh, also, I also would like to cons have everyone consider is whatever the reason for this. Um, has she exhausted all of her other leave? She has vacation time, and that was so. That's the combined. If you give her vacation time, and the combined five percent merit increase amount of time, it still doesn't get to where she actually feels she needs to be. Well, that would be up to us, correct? That's totally up to you. Absolutely, it, it is. And I'm not trying to pressure you. But no. if you ran a, a business pressure. on your own, you might say, I'd like to do this for my employees. And it would be easy because it, you'd be taking it from your money. We represent the taxpayers, so we're working with their money. And so I understand we have to be very critical in our thinking about that. But I also think for our employees to show that when someone is really in need, that we are okay with stepping up for them. But, Commissioner, we can't do that for them. I agree. I understand so the problems. What, what we do is putting pressure on our city manager to do. Um, but we're giving her the equivalent of her merit increase if we were to give her 
the, not the 5%. Mayonnaise. So it's we're just trading one thing for the other. Same thing to me. No, it is. It's six of one half dozen of another, but here's the deal. It, what what we're doing is is we're 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 not giving her the merit increase. She's asking for it in in the um, sick leave form, which is fine by me. I mean, she needs it. Um, but I'm not so sure that I feel like six weeks is is legit and a legit ask. I think that it should be equi equi equal to whatever her merit pay increase should be. would have would have been at the top. Like okay. giving her that amount because I think that that makes sense. You know, I mean, even though I know you may not her 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 merit increase may not be up to that five percent. I think it's fair to give that five percent because of the fact that she did step. I up. just have seen so many people who did not perform leave the city with such parachutes and such I get it I, I don't think that's applicable here no I don't yeah. I don't either and and again we would put in the safeguard that I just spoke about so that it's not even an option and it, candidly it's it's not I think there's how a long, how long what safeguard did you put in that it would have to be used within 18 months and it could not be um, the subject to any type of payout and since she's no longer the ICM should she yeah. leave the city yes. I said, well, as of August. if she's no longer the ICM, as of August the 2nd, I believe we've hired a city manager, we don't know what position she'll have. Uh, will this be then asked if she's in a position where she might want to, what do they do with sick leave? Do you lose it? Because she's no longer our direct report. It would, it would stay in her banks. She, w she wouldn't lose it. So it, should she leave the city? Does she take it with her? No. Yeah. No, that's what she was saying to put in some. Oh, if right. she left the city, she it would not be the subject to a payout. Yeah. Right. The only thing she could use it for is to for her leave. Right. So sick leave. Yeah. Correct. Yes. And I'm it's legitimate. I'm make, not going to go into it, but it's yeah. legitimate. No, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not arguing. I'm, it's not I would make a motion <laughs> to um, allow for the transfer of the uh, five percent merit increase into the thirteen day uh, sick leave. And we will still do the review. With, with the evaluation as of, and it condition. has to be done within um, 30 days? What? The evaluation. The review. We can do well, them now. Right review. Oh, do them now. I'm sorry. They can just the hand them out to us and we can do them now. Second the motion. I couldn't hear through the screen. He seconded right. the motion. We can do them now. We don't have to wait 30 days. So. Okay. So did we have a second? Yes, yes, we did. I'm sorry. Okay, and it was with the conditions so that there was no... Yeah, that's because yeah. okay. I'll say. And so let me just make sure we're talking about the same. You, you just basically said it was 103 hours. So 13 yeah. days. One, I exactly. One I, that's okay. Hours. 13 days. To keep going back to the math. Never mind. I, I got 103 hours, 13 days, which equates to a 5% uh, salary increase of $9,475. You got that right, Lynn? And, and you wanted the 18 months to use... Correct. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a, a moot point. But anyway, um, so call the roll, please. Oh, and you know what? Wait a second. Before we call the roll, um, I didn't invite um, Commissioner Boylston to make any comments. Did you have any, sir? I think. I think the discussion. I think the discussion was fantastic. No, okay. all you right, guys good. covered that's it all. Good. Call the roll, please. <laughs> Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Oh, Thank you. I guess we do have another page. Sorry. <laughs> Shut there. Uh, moving on to ordinance number 25-21. Uh, it's a first read. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 1, General Provisions, Article 1.1, 1 .1, Adoption of Code, Section 1.1.1, .1 Reference, and Section 1.1.6, .1 Amendments, and by amending Chapter 2, Administrative Provisions, Article 2.4, General Procedures, Section 2.4.5, Procedures for obtaining development approvals, subsection 2.4.5M, amendment to the land development regulations to require at least one member of the city commission sponsor a privately initiated amendment to the land development regulations prior to the submittal of an application, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. We First not, reading, no presentation. Motion we to approve. Have, Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia. And yes. Okay, now we're on to comments and inquiries on non-agenda items. City Manager. Good evening again. Uh, I just said one item. Um, the Florida League of Cities is having their annual conference. And I believe the Vice Mayor is the representative of this body, and she has voting uh, obligations at that conference. 
she's not able to attend. I hate to speak for you, but uh, we have to discuss this. And I do believe the deputy vice mayor is the alternate Indeed. for the body. But Ms. Johnson, for the record, stated that I must vote in any way that she would have voted had she been present. And I'll you tell you what they are. Yes. So it, <laughs> it, it, I bet she will. It may be a moot point, but um, <laughs> it, probably to clarify, if we had a, a vote of the commission to authorize the deputy vice mayor to vote on behalf of the body in the city. Yeah, you have to. Motion to approve of the deputy vice mayor voting at the League of Cities on behalf of the city. Good mistake. No, I'm just <laughs> Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Franco. Yes. Anything else? Uh, no, ma'am. All right, city attorney. Um, I have nothing, but I just wanted to say that this was such a great meeting because I think, you know, the budget, it showed how government works. Not everyone was happy. Not everyone got what they wanted, but we got to the conclusion. We got to the finish line, and I'm just, I'm very proud to sit up here, so that's it. Oh, thank you, Lynn. All right, let's start with the commission. Let's start with uh, Mr. Boylston since you're online there. Thank you so much, Mayor. And the only thing I want to keep it short, thank you for the patience and flexibility. I had to make plans for this, uh, this family trip uh, a long time ago. Um, so thank you for that this evening. We hope you have a great time. Right. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, uh, Commissioner Bolston, we missed you. Thank you for coming, though. I, too, am going to be away. I'll start out before I forget. I'm going to be away officially. I don't know how many meetings I'm going to meet, miss, but I intend to try and call in. I'm asking permission. I guess I have to do that. That's the beginning. I, it's a requirement. Um, asking your consent to be absent. I'm going to make every meeting. I'm taking my laptop. I will be here. Secondly, I appreciate all the work that everyone did and all of the different uh, discussions tonight. I wanted everyone in the city to know that the commission is paying attention. Although we have had a lot of turnover, the churning of this city for the past five years that I've been on it has just been overwhelming. So I think people think we're not paying attention, but we are. So no matter who's sitting in that seat, we are paying attention. And I'd like to thank everyone for all of their attendance tonight, input, et cetera. I'm going to also remember that the, the uh, Bahamian independence was celebrated this past weekend, and we had a great time, junk canoe at Spady Museum, and hopefully it's gonna be even better next year. I don't know how, but uh, we're gonna try to make it that. We don't give a lot of attention to our Bahamian residents. I'm a very, my heart goes out to our Haitian American residents because they have, a, a lot of them have family back in Haiti. It's a very uncertain time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many Cuban Americans we have in the community, community, but they also are going through a difficult time. So just uh, our hearts and prayers go out to all of them. And we're here if there's anything we can do. And that's just about it. Thank you all for listening to uh, my opinions. Um, thank you. Uh, safe travels, Ryan. Safe travels, Ms. Johnson. I'm getting out of here, too. Uh, my only comment tonight is to congratulate our superstar. I uh, wish her grandmother was here. Uh, Coco Goff. Yes, mm. She will be representing us in the Olympics, uh, coming off of a great uh, week at Wimbledon. Wimbledon yep. So uh, I don't know what time she'll be playing in Tokyo, but uh, I'll try to be tuning in. Luckily for YouTube TV, you can tape pretty much anything. That's right, absolutely. But, uh, good luck, Coco. Yeah, and go for it, Coco. And uh, Commissioner Cassell? Have, my updates this week are the same as the last meeting, so we'll just leave it at that. And Ms. Johnson, I really, I enjoyed your opinions this evening. Thank you. Okay, and, and finally, I just want to say that I, too, am very proud of how everybody handled themselves tonight. Um, there was a lot of controversial issues. Um, we had some things that were not easy to speak about, but um, we did it, and uh, and that makes for a good commission uh, meeting uh, from start to finish, and I'm glad for any, everybody who um, attended. I also wanted to um, uh, speak out. I had a couple of meetings, and it's very interesting. Um, these are comments by the public uh, coming in and sitting down with me and talking to me about what they think we could be doing better. And one of the things that they said that we could do better is talking about what we do well. 
we don't do enough of it. So it's something that I think we should approach the new city manager when he comes in, doing some things like maybe rein reinstating the uh, uh, little pamphlet that we used to put in the um, the water department billing, just highlighting some of the important things that are happening in the city. It really will keep, I think, people feeling like we're moving forward and, and progress is happening in Delray Beach. And then I wanted to mention one other thing. I am on the, um, the hospital board here in Delray Beach. But there's something that's going on, and I think it's very important um, for my colleagues up here to understand what's happening. We have a, um, a spinal surgical center that's going to be um, uh, or is proposing to open in the, um, in the acreage. And um, being on the board, you kind of see things from a, maybe a little bit different light, and I just wanted to share this because I think it's really important because it's going to affect us. Um, you know, when a hospital is functioning and having to take everybody in, there is a margin of, you know, profit um, that is taken, but you get the good with the with the paying with the non-paying, and unfortunately, surgical procedures are a paying part of that hospital. So when you start pulling off, you know, the real money-making parts of in organizations, you leave them more bare bones than they already are. And yes, this is a profit-oriented hospital. We're not, you know, in a non-profit situation. But it's just really important to understand the ripple effect that can happen because when you are siphoning a lot of the profit part of it and you're leaving the rest of it there, we're all going to need to be seeing a hospital or some, one of our loved ones will be needing a hospital stay at some point in time. And it scares the heck out of me to think that you might be operating on a less and less dime because of what the decisions that are being made. There was a point at one point in time limitations around hospitals where nothing could open up that would compete with that hospital because that kept that hospital strong for everybody. And that has been deteriorated. That's our government, you know, our government above us. So it is very important, and I have not been very outspoken about this because I, I, I worry of my position there and my position here, but I, I, I can't sit here and not say something because I think that it really does affect every single person in our community, and I think it will. And so it's an easy thing to think that, oh, well, you know, that's great. We're going to have a great you know, surgical center that's going to be able to fix people's backs. Great. Spinal surgical center. But what is that really going to mean to our hospital? And that's the question I think each of us has to ask one another ourselves. Well, they're in the process of getting approvals, and uh, that's going through the county. So it's just that you have to ask yourself, how is that going to really affect um, the care that we get in the hospitals that we're going to need to maybe frequent? So anyway, I'm going to leave it at that. Just wanted to put that out there so you guys can do your own, you know, um, uh, yep, research on it and uh, and maybe write some letters if you feel like it. Thank you all very much. And